Hey guys, uh, this is the second video of my tier ranking of the Thomas episodes, uh, season 1 through 7. And today I'm doing season 3 through 4, so part 2 of the Audrey era. As I said before, this was originally going to be one video, season 1 through 4, but, you know, this recording particularly, it's like going to be well over an hour long, so I feel like, you know, I just have to split it up. But yeah, so um, this video is season 3 through 4. Uh, just some uh, slight changes. Um, I'm not going to be using as many video clips uh, from episodes unless it's like necessary. And that's because it's just a huge hassle I found trying to f cut all the clips, get out all the files of the episodes, and also modifying them in a way that you know doesn't detect copyright. So yeah, I'm going to be using promotional photos. But yeah, I'll still use a few clips here and there. So yeah, uh, without further ado, let's get started. Alright, first we've got A Scarf for Percy, based on Percy and the Trousers from the Railway series. And I'm going to put this in the A tier, because I've always liked this episode. And one major reason is that uh, the story it's based off of, um, the story itself is not really good, uh, at least in the Railway series book, because I believe Henry the Green Engine is the only book to have five stories instead of four, so it, it definitely felt very rushed, like jammed in, you know. It, it's not really relevant to the other stories either. The story about Percy, even though Henry's in it, but the way they adapted it uh, definitely made it flow better within the continuity of the show. And also just adding the snow just made it a lot more... Um, well, I mean, just look at this first shot. I mean, it's beautiful. It's it's good symbolism for, for what was to come in the season. I mean, I mean, this episode has quite a lot of firsts. Um, you know, first of season three, obviously. Uh, first narrated by Michael Angelis. Pretty much the first episode in, like, five or six years. You know, the first episode after that hiatus it took, you know, uh, when, you know, Tugs and Shining Time Station were being produced. And it's also the first one to feature the new, um, real sounding instruments for the music as opposed to the synthesizers. But I, I've always liked this episode because I feel like it really shows Percy at his best. Um, you know, very cheeky and just downright savage, but also, you know, very oblivious. I mean, I mean, you all know the funnel quote. Uh, it's just, oh, that's just one of the biggest roasts. I mean. Yeah, and just like the innuendos for that, you know, double meanings, you know, you've only got a small one. <laughs> you can, I mean, that's clearly, you could analyze that as a dick joke for trains. <laughs> um, yeah, and just Henry's expression here, it just, he just looks so offended. <laughs> like, yeah, um... Yeah, so, uh, I mean, uh, I've always found this story really funny. Uh, I also have a funny memory of, you know, I was once watching this, and my dad was in the TV room, too, and my dad thought that the, you know, Percy had run over the two workmen because he, he thought that the jam was blood. I mean, is he the only one to think that? I'm sure other people thought that, too. <laughs> and I wish they kept the shot of the truck getting hit. I mean, that... <laughs> Just, just lots of humor in this episode. Just wacky crash visuals. I mean, the fat controller just getting completely, you know, drenched in jam. Uh, oh, going back to, like, you know, double entendre. I mean, this whole episode could be used in one of those, um, what is it, like the many sounds of George Carlin or Ringo, uh, Michael Angelis. Because I remember there's also the quote that... Uh, <laughs> Percy's driver had taken off the trousers and gave him a good rub down. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Just, yeah, it, they clearly had fun making this episode. Uh, I also like, uh, you know, well, obviously they added these, these scenes to stretch out the time, but, you know, I do like they added, you know, Henry felt sorry for Percy at the end, you know. Uh, I mean, it was, yeah, it wasn't needed, but I just thought that was a nice touch. So yeah, this was definitely a great start to the new season. I mean, uh, yeah. And then we have Percy's Promise. Uh, yeah, this is also going... This is definitely going in the S tier. Uh, I mean, it, again, it's just another classic. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this episode was not adapted in season two when it should have been, you know, given the order of the Railway Series stories. And, you know, probably they just didn't have the technicalities. Uh, and, you know, I'm glad they did wait because... Wow, these flood visuals, I mean, I think, you know, with the experience with Tugs, you know, they got more comfortable with models and electronics. They These flood visuals are just amazing. Uh, 
And it's just such an epic story. Uh, you just feel so proud of Percy at the end. Uh, you know, the previous episode, you had Percy acting like a complete jackass and jerk. But, but here you see him really try hard. And it's just so rewarding. I mean, you know, it's also helped by the great storm theme. Uh, you know, that's kind of a... If you didn't know, that's Percy's theme in minor key. Yeah, I guess the only nitpick I have, and again, this is just technical stuff, but... Yeah, they, they didn't really do a good job with the rain visuals. They just, like, you know, what did they, spray smoke on him? or So, yeah, but still, I mean, I just love this episode from the water visuals. Yeah, I mean, Percy's Promise, it's it's a classic. All right, next we have Time for Trouble, which is based off of, uh, what was it, Double double Header. Uh, yeah, I, I, this one's all right. Uh, I'm going to put it in the, let's see. I'm going to put it in the B tier. I mean, it's still an, it's still a nice story. Uh, I just feel like, you know, unlike per uh, Scarf for Percy, it's, it wasn't as good of, like, adapting the source material. Um, you know, and probably just because, you know, it was made a whole season later than it should have been as far as, like, the, you know, Order of the Railway Series stories. Um, <clears throat> uh, one thing I never liked was the title, Time for Trouble. That That's a bit of an awkward title. Uh, I don't know, it was doubleheader, like, a rude term or something, or controversial, but, yeah, I, I don't really have many thoughts on this one, I think it's fine, um, yeah, I mean, any, most of the issues I have are not necessarily with the episode itself, it's just, like, the title, and, uh, although I will say, one thing I never liked is, you know, they never showed Toby, like, actually breaking down, they just cut from his water tank to him suddenly being stopped, I thought that was a bit cheap, but, uh, again, maybe it was a behind-the-scenes reason, <laughs> But yeah, it's a, I, it's a, you know, James having to push Toby. I, I th always thought that was funny. And at the end, you know, the end line where after the boys tease James, you know, he's Michelangelo's does this funny like, ha ah, ha, ah! and George Carlin's just like, Pah! yeah. So again, uh, this episode's fine. I don't really think much of it. Um, uh, but I'm putting it in the B tier because it does have some funny moments. Uh. All right, now we have Gordon and the Famous Visitor, based off of Domeless Engines, which actually came before uh, Pop Goes the Diesel. I'm definitely putting this one in the S tier. Uh, it's one of my favorites of the season, and it's just another great uh, Gordon Makes an Ass Out of Himself episode. I just love those stories. Uh, what I really appreciate about this episode is, um, unlike, say, Tender Engines, um... They found a really good way to, you know, with the, this one-time character who never appeared again. Uh, was this model scratch built, or was it, like, just a Hornby model they found? Or, But anyway, even though this model, you know, it doesn't have a face and all that, and doesn't actually speak, they found a great way to adapt this story without it looking cheap. You know, it's shot and edited in a way, uh, the, the script, I think, is really good with that, too. It just... It quickly establishes the exposition with City of Truro. It says who he is. Um, I really like, you know, how uh, Duck explains to Percy that the engine's a celebrity and explains what that means. Um, you're given all the information that you need. So I thought that was really clever. Um, but again, it's also just a funny episode. Uh, just something about the scene where Gordon races through Wellsworth. I don't really know what it is. Um... It's just so funny. To, you know, I know what it is. It's the way it's edited. A combination of the editing and the music. You know, a lot of these shots are sped up. Just the sound design, too. Uh, just the loud effects they use. You really feel Gordon panting really hard as he just rumbles through the station. And the music, too, is kind of like that. It's kind of like this cartoon rearrangement of Gordon's theme. You know, definitely more urgent, basically. I mean, he did it, I'll do it. Uh... And then just Duck and Edward just laughing their ass off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there's not really much else I can say about this one. It's just, you know, the, the visual of Gordon's dome falling off into the river. I always thought they did really well. Um, interestingly, in the book, they had just a black hole where the dome was. Whereas here, I mean, you see this, what is this, like a pipe? I always found that interesting. Uh, and just the ending line, you know, is just, wow, just such karma, such savagery. <laughs> Yeah, so I've always loved this one. Next we have Donald's Duck. Yeah, obviously this was named after, you know, the Disney character. Uh, yeah, I don't really have many memories of watching this in uh, 
as a child, and I know I must have given that the previous episode I just talked about was on that video. But yeah, I mean, this is another just cute little uh, engine playing prank episode. Uh, you know, I've always loved Donald and Douglas, so that's a big plus. Uh, let's see. I'm going to put this in the B tier. Uh, I, I guess what really... I just love, you know, how Donald is just fed up with Duck not shutting up at night and just completely roasts him. <laughs> like, like he's basically telling Duck to shut the f*** up in a G-rated way. <laughs> yeah, the sound effects I also found really cute. Uh, they must have used some sort of kazoo or something. Um, what I remember most about this episode is the music. Just a really nice arrangement of Duck's theme. Um, also, what I like about this episode is, um, like I said in my uh, Seasons Ranked video, you can just, just see how three-dimensional a lot of these shots are. Like this shot right here of Duck passing the pond. I mean, wow, just fantastic model work. And also the beach shots, whatever this arch thing is. So yeah, uh, yeah, this is a great episode. Uh, this is another. Ex this also has another example of like a quote when used out of context could be quite funny. Uh, do that night, Donald's driver and fireman got busy. Yeah. And next we come to Thomas gets bumped, which correct me if I'm wrong. This is the first, at least of this series, the first non Audrey story, and um. Yeah, I, I have mixed thoughts about this one, because it's very confusing. It, it, it's one of the examples of, it feels like two stories pushed together. Um, I'm going to put this in B, because unlike some other ones, it's pretty harmless. And yeah, it's a bit confusing, but, but still, I can follow it okay. Uh, although it didn't take me until I was an adult to realize Thomas gets bumped. It wasn't like, you know, just Thomas bumping on the tracks. He got bumped from the schedule. I thought that was clever. Um, but yeah, uh, it does have the same problem that a lot of these other non-Audrey stories have, where the, it's not very a coherent narrative. But again, uh, this one's fine. Yeah, I mean, the crash visual's always nice. Uh, what I do like about this episode is that, you know, Thomas is really sad because he thinks Birdie's taken over. But just something about the ending of this episode... Uh, one of those, like, really wholesome moments, I think maybe because of the music, uh, it, it just really gets me every time. I mean, it's just such a nice ending of these two friends. Um, there's a really nice message about sharing and that one isn't better than the other. I, I thought that was really nice. Uh, a, a really good point in Thomas and Bertie's relationship. All right, on to Thomas, Percy, and the Dragon. And, yeah, this is another favorite of mine. This is going in the S tier. Um, honestly, this is probably my second favorite out of the season. You know, Gordon the Famous Visitor would be third. Um, and you can probably guess what the first is. Uh, in fact, this was very close to making my top 20 episodes. Um, it just didn't quite make it. But, yeah, uh, I've always had great memories of this episode. Um, and one thing is, you know, it was, there was this VHS called Thomas Percy and the Dragon. Obviously, this was the first episode on it. And the episode mainly contained a lot of the great season two ones. But, yeah, I, I have great memories watching this as a kid. Um, it's a very, uh, how do I put this? It's a great, creepy season three episode. And I, I don't know how to describe it. It just, I think just the visuals, the music, the overall atmosphere, uh, Chinese Dragon, I mean, look at these shots, like, when it's all lit up at night, are just so beautiful, but so eerie at the same time, you know, with the, and the music of the Chinese instruments, yeah, it's, I mean, the scene where Thomas passes by Percy at night, it is so goddamn scary, but yeah, I always love this one, uh, I think, um, it's a great, like, uh, revenge on Percy for, you know, Percy pretending to be a ghost in the previous season. Um, at the same time, though, I do, even though it's a bit cheesy, you know, as far as, like, the line's placement, uh, I do really like, you know, the line of Thomas saying, uh, what was it, like, sometimes we do get scared, but if we're not afraid to tell others, that means we're quite brave, too. Yeah, that's kind of cheesy, but at the same time, that's a really great moral, um, I thought it did it better than Tale of the Brave. And, yeah. Although, I have to ask, what the hell was Thomas still doing with it the next morning? Like, Sodor's only, what, 
60 miles wide. So this must have been at least 12, like 12 hours later. So what was he doing with it? But yeah, I mean, what else can I say? The music is so frightening. Like if I had seen this thing go by me at night, I too would have thought I was going crazy. <laughs> then we come to Diesel Does It Again. Yeah, this is a great one too. Uh, I'm going to put it in the A tier. It's a great episode. I feel like it's definitely the best way they could have brought Diesel back. You know, coming back for a second try at screwing things over and failing miserably. <laughs> you know, the harbor sets are really well done. I mean, just, you know, the water, the ships, the atmosphere. Um, and you just really, you know, I really like how they use Duck and Percy as the main characters. And obviously Duck, you know, he, he just looks really hurt that <laughs> Diesel came back. But yeah, again, it's just another great Diesel screwing up episode. I mean, him pushing the trucks into the sea. And just the music, too, especially at the end. It just fits Diesel so well in the Season 3 style. Uh, especially that ending ditty. That's always stuck with me. Yeah, they thought that this would be the last appearance of Diesel. Well, apparently not. Or at least... In this episode, I know he was in other season three episodes, but uh, yeah, it's just a good way to bring Diesel back. You know, it doesn't feel forced or anything. Uh, you know, he's given a second chance and screws up again. <laughs> All right, now we come to the episode that Audrey would rank as a big fat F, Henry's Forest. But I'm going to put this as a big solid S. Yeah, I've said this before. I regret not putting this in my favorite episodes video. Uh... I just really didn't like it as a child, and I, that was just because, you know, I it was too, you know, wishy-washy, mushy, you know. Like, but as an adult, I just really appreciate it. It's just such a simple yet really deep message, I feel. It's a great message for kids. It's a great message for anyone, honestly. Uh, the thing that separates this from, like, other kids stories about nature you know usually it's like you know like in the lorax it's people destroying nature and all that uh whereas this one it's nature destroying nature and so you know it's just the natural order of things um and just you know when the trees are all replanted henry learns that it doesn't mean it's the end it just means it's a new beginning you know rebirth and that's just such a great message i mean when one door closes another one opens I hate to quote Disney, but the circle of life. And using Henry as the main character was a brilliant choice. I mean, you know, it's a nice side of him other than, like, the grumpy Henry you usually see before. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you all know why this episode is great. Uh, it's just, the forest is such a beautiful set. I mean, this is, like, top-tier model work. And then, of course, the music. Again, what, what can I say that other people haven't already said? Henry's sad theme, by God, it's just... Something about Henry's sad face, and I said this earlier, it's just look at this. It's like just a sad old man that you just insulted. <laughs> it's just something about this. He just looks... Oh, man, it just really gets you. And, but you know, the ending theme, oh, my God. I mean, still a tearjerker. Just so beautiful, just so bittersweet uh man i still just get chills thinking about the ending of this episode just like everything's going to be all right again just that theme is just so relevant in life not all bad things mean the end of good yeah it's again not much more i can really say about this episode other than just yeah it's probably the most emotional thomas story and that's saying something considering you have an episode where an engine gets locked in a shed for years and buried alive <laughs> yeah all right now we've got the trouble with mud um i'm debating c and d uh let's see you know i'm gonna put this in i'm gonna put it in c because i still think it has some saving graces to it but so the, the main problem with this episode is it unlike say gordon and the famous visitor this adaptation of the story just doesn't work as well outside of the original context of the, you know, the original Railway Series book. Uh, the story leaves, which this adapts, is between d uh, off the rails and down the mine. So the reason Gordon isn't pulling trains is because he's being punished for being an idiot with the ditch. <laughs> yeah, whereas here, he's kind of just punished for being too dirty? Like, what? Yeah, so... It, it just doesn't work well outside the original context. Um, yeah, uh, 
especially at the end, um, you know, Thomas says, you know, like, can Gordon pull passenger trains again? It just shows that this story wasn't supposed to be of this era. But the reason I'm putting it in C is because despite its poor adaptation, it still is quite a funny episode. Uh, oh, and another thing I forgot to add is I feel like Gordon's not the type of engine who would be just not care about being dirty. That, that just doesn't feel right, uh, you know, especially with other episodes, but... Anyway, the reason I'm putting this in C and not D is because this episode does have some f really funny moments. I mean, Gordon's spraying mud all over James. I mean, come on. I mean, that definitely looks like poop. I mean, yeah, you just put in a fart sound. It basically writes itself. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, some of the visuals of Gordon with the trucks are quite funny. Um, the storm atmosphere is also pretty nice, uh, even though... It, if you've seen that Unlucky Tug recent video, they, apparently they refilmed the original sh scene of Gordon helping James up the hill. You know, that was done during a stormy atmosphere. And apparently, he, at least he theorizes, because they got the wrong coaches. The, the new shot works well, too. It's just, you know, it doesn't have the stormy atmosphere. You know, this episode has some funny moments, but yeah, it's just not a really good adaptation of the source material. Uh, yeah, so this is going in C. Um, if I had to give it a rant, it would be a C-, minus, kind of hovering on the D range, but it just has a little bit that makes up for it. Next, we have No Joke for James. Yeah, this this isn't a great episode either. Um, <sighs> where should I put this in? I'm going to put this in D. Um, so, where the previous episode hovers between C and D, this hovers on the top of D, like D+, plus, D, C, and... Yeah, it's just another one of these season three episodes. I think it's based off of two stories, but it, it just doesn't flow very well, and it's, you know, James plays a trick on Gordon. Yeah, I guess it has some funny moments to it, but it, it's just... It's kind of hard to explain. Just the way they wrote James in this episode, it, these two stories just don't mesh well together. James plays a trick on Gordon, and then later on pulls an important passenger. It, it's just... A, a weird episode in that way. Um, I I'm just trying to think. Uh, obviously it has some iconic lines, you know, some jokes are funny, but not this one. <laughs> I don't hate this one, but it is a, you know, it is, it does, it is a clunker, you know, uh, yeah, I, it, so it's going in D. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, is this the last time we hear James's full theme? Or did it appear in other season three episodes? But yeah, no joke for James. Next, we have Thomas Percy and the Post Train. I'm going to put this in A tier, because it is quite a nice, you know, uh, it, I mean, the, the, a lot of the best things about this episode are just the night visuals. They're just beautiful. I mean, just look at these shots. Uh, I feel like this is a really nice episode describing how mail trains work, and, you know, uh, one thing I like is that the fat controller is very much on the engine's side, you know, when that person complains about the post being late, uh, you don't, um, that's a nice touch, and yeah, it, there's not much I can really say about this episode. The visuals and the music are just brilliant, and another feel-good episode where, you know, at the end they give, what is, is this a homeless guy, or is it just some guy who missed his train? I don't know, but yeah, it's just another one of those feel-good season three episodes. And, you know, the interactions with Harold I always found funny, you know, especially at the end where, you know, it's too windy. That shows that Harold's not always reliable. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is a a Alright, this next episode is one that I'm just completely split down the middle. I'm just so unsure. Um, that is Trust Thomas. The crash in this episode is absolutely hysterical. It's just so over-the-top wacky. I mean, you know, they want the extra effort. Like, what is this thing on the pond? Yeah, it's so it's just such an iconic crash. But it's in a story that's just so messy. Um... I'm going to have to put this in the D tier. I, I want to put it higher, but just... Yeah, so this episode is like two subplots, or I guess you could argue three, all just shoved together with not tied together very well at all. I mean, you got the subplot with Thomas and meeting Bertie, who needs his road repairs. Gordon and Jay, uh, James pretending to be sick. And then the trucks, you know, causing Thomas to crash. It's... And then, of course, to uh, at the end, like, it's just so loosely tied together, like, oh, Thomas suddenly remembers that Birdie needs his road repaired. Like, oh, yeah, that was a thing. You just completely forget about that plot. Um, what is the moral of this story supposed to be? Uh, Thomas is trustworthy even if he gets into a major accident? I mean, that's... Yeah, it's just a very awkward episode. 
Um, and I guess what always rubbed me the wrong way is the fact that the James pretending to be ill, that subplot's never really resolved. I mean, you know, he doesn't get punished, he doesn't get any, like, retribution or karma. You know, Sir Handel did the same thing, but at least, you know, he was shut up in the shed for a while. Um, maybe this did take inspiration from Bad Day for Sir Handel, but anyway, yeah, it just... You know, at the end, James is like, oh, sorry, just a misunderstanding. Screw you. Yeah, so, uh... That said, though, I mean, obviously, you know, the, as I said before, the crash is just so over the top. Uh, like, you know, the, the whole idea of having Thomas, you know, just run onto... What is this thing supposed to be? Like, yeah, what is this supposed to be? Like, um, I get the sense, you know, since he was pushed over the switches, it's an abandoned track. But still, like, what is this trolley boat thing supposed to be? Like, obviously it can't carry a whole train over, uh, so yeah, uh, it's just even more confusing. Um, yeah, so, I don't hate this episode, but it's just really awkward. I, I just can't put it higher than D. All right, next we come to Mavis. I'm gonna put this in the A tier, just because I have lots of good memories watching this episode. Uh, yeah, I mean, the sets alone are just so impressive. I mean, these beautiful winter shots, and just, how do I describe this? These sets really emphasize how rural this area of Sodor is, like how remote it is. You know, this quarry tram road that goes through the hills, it's, with all these windy tracks, it's just really impressive. I mean, and also, this is just a funny episode, you know, it's always been for me. As a kid, you know, just seeing Mavis make a fool out of herself. Yeah, but as an adult, this lot, the line, um, I can't be the only one who thinks this, but the line where the narrator says, an angry farmer was telling Mavis just what she could do with her train. That always cracks me up because I, is he implying that the farmer told Mavis to like, you can take that train and shove it up your ass. <laughs> yeah, I know that probably wasn't the intention, but still, it's a great double entendre moment. <laughs> Oh, I mean, this model work right here, this dip, really impressive. And, oh yeah, the breakdown train theme used in this episode. I love this arrangement, and I think it's the only time we hear it in this season, correct me if I'm wrong. Just, it's just so much more intense than the previous seasons. Uh, and you just see, like, it just really emphasizes how hard it is for Toby to push the whole train back. Yeah, just, it's an edited perfectly, just how much hard work this is. And I always feel like it, you feel for both Mavis and Toby. I mean, Mavis is just quirky and wants to, you know, rearrange things a bit, where Toby's just, like, fed up. <laughs> I always like the interactions between these two. <laughs> I guess my only issue, really, is uh, Diesel's role just feels so out of place. But, you know, there's behind-the-scenes reasons for why he was used instead of Daisy. Also, it always really baffled me. Why was this the only season three episode that used the outro theme, or at least in some versions? Like, just, yeah, I, I don't really know what to say about that. Why this episode of all of them? Anyway, yeah, there's Mavis going in the A tier. And Toby's tightrope, um, you know, I'm going to put Toby's tightrope in the S tier just because it has, you know, the action is just so great. I mean, oh man, I was talking about modeling and Mavis. Wow, just... This river, oh my god, the way they did this scene, just these torrents, it just feels so real. Like, you feel how much they're raging and how perilous a position Toby's in. I mean, they must have been so scared of, like, the model dropping in the water and being damaged. I mean, yeah, it's not just like a, you know, a pond fountain. It's It feels like a real raging torrent. Uh, and you don't see any evidence of, like, um, what did they even use for these water shots? Did they use, like, a pond liner or something? But, yeah, the model, I mean, this season alone had a tons of great mo uh, water shots. But, yeah, I feel like this is one of the best, aside from maybe the this waterfall. But, anyway, yeah, it's, wow, the model work in this episode is great. And, yeah, it's just a great action-packed story. I mean, um, these two episodes are a really great introduction to Mavis, like, um... I feel like Mavis is just such a great female character for this show. I'm not, yeah, I like Daisy too, but I can definitely see, even though I don't agree with it, I can definitely see her being too sassy and all that. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, those two episodes are real classics in my opinion. Now we come to Edward, Trevor, and the really useful party, and I feel like this is a really underrated episode. Um, I'm also gonna put this in A. Just. 
yeah, it, no one really talks about this one much, but it's just one of those really feel-good episodes where, you know, it's self-contained, a short little story. It's not, like, part of any bigger picture. But, yeah, it's just such a nice episode. Um, I guess, you know, the ending sums it up really well. It's just And, yeah, make all the Trevor Pedo jokes you want uh, I, in universe, though. I mean, it's just... It's definitely the music cue they use, but just... Just seeing Trevor being so happy of all the poor kids getting the chance to go on a trip, it's, man, I don't know, it really tugs. I mean, it's just so wholesome, just such a simple, simple kindness that we need in this world today. Yeah, um, and, you know, it's also, you know, great Edward episode too, uh, just uh, him, you know, getting the idea to put the posters on him. Just, yeah, there's not much I can really say, but just such a wholesome episode uh i like that they cut diesel out i mean yeah he was probably there to say like who would want to ride on such an old traction engine or a blue steam engine i'm sure that's what he was supposed to do but i feel like the using birdie as kind of the uh, not the antagonist but like the boaster was a much better decision and then you know they you get stuck in the mud yeah, um, and again, you know, these this model work is just so great. It, you know, it just it feels like a real party. You know, a, a garden party. Yeah, I I just love this episode. It, it, I feel like this is one of the most underrated episodes, to be honest. Just such kindness. It's just the simplicity that you know we need in the world these days. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to get on this whole soapbox, but yeah, uh, definitely an underrated episode. All right, now we come to Buzz Buzz, or James Goes Buzz Buzz. And this is the first episode of that second half of season three where they, you know, had completely new sets. Um, although I do think this episode and the, the next one, they have scenes where maybe some scenes were shot during the first half. So, yeah, the Vicarage Orchard and the next one, All at Sea, probably the, the lower stuttery scene. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, this is always a funny episode. Uh, I'm debating, should I put it in A or B? It's not the best adaptation of the source material, but at the same time, I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna put this in A. It's still a funny story. Um, I guess, you know, my only issue is, like, you know, especially the ending line is just really about the bee's knees which is just a really awkward ending line, but I'm sure they put that in, you know, because it didn't make sense talking about Boko if he's already been on the island for a whole season. But anyway, uh, this episode, you know, creep, and I'm sure it did to a, lo a lot of other people too, it kind of creeped me out. That this B visual, this animation, man, it just, I'm curious as to why they chose this Disney style for the, the B, but just like the, the sounds James makes too, like you know, both dubs are just like, ee! Yeah, I mean, there's not really much I can say about this episode. It's just funny. I feel like the editing in this episode is really great. Uh, first, you got the stop motion of all the passengers running away. That's that's just so funny. And then, uh, you know, James spinning on the turntable. Uh, just a lot of these shots, I think, are sped up. The James Goes Buzz Buzz VHS was another one I had, and it was another one I really liked. Um, not all episodes were great, and we'll get to a really bad one on this VHS later, but... Yeah, I, I've always liked this episode. Uh, it just makes you think, like, if James's nose gets red, uh, does that mean, like, he has blood? I mean, he obviously can feel pain in his face. So, you know, these more unanswerable Thomas questions. All right, the next one is All at Sea. Um, I have a really complicated relationship with this episode because I hated it as a kid. I get, same reason I hated Henry's Force. Just so I didn't really like all this emotional stuff um i think this is one of brit alcroft's favorite episodes and i can definitely see why uh, uh let's see oh i feel so bad for doing this uh, i'm gonna put it i'm gonna put it in b i definitely understand you know the appeal of it now i just i just i feel like the ending of this episode's really nice but yeah I, i'm just trying to put my thoughts in words with this episode uh i'll put it this way i do feel like um it could have been established better as to why Duck suddenly decided, you know, that the best dreams are those we can dream of. I mean, yeah, that's such a beautiful quote. But at the same time, I mean, what did he do? He rescued the injured sailor and took him. It's kind of confusing, actually. What did he do? He took him all the way. You know, Harold brought him in from the boat. Okay, fine. Uh, why did he go on board Duck? Why didn't he just go straight in an ambulance? You know, he has to go all the way down to where Birdie is, and then Birdie takes him to the hospital, which, 
And I hope, you know, he didn't have to go in an ambulance after going in Britain. It's just, why couldn't they just take him straight to the hospital? That that always really confused me. Um, but at the same time, though, I definitely fully understand why so many people like this one. It is it is a touching episode. Uh, yeah, I feel I would have liked this a lot better had there been more... Uh, yeah, I, I guess I just have to put it here because as a child, I absolutely hated this one. Um... Oh, man, I feel so bad for putting it there, but... Yeah, um, I guess, you know, the whole injured sailor subplot, I, I feel like they could have made it a little more um, poignant or, like, uh, that shows Duck's advantage of being on the rails. You know, here's a good analysis. Here's a good analogy. What I think a better way to do it would be, you know, that Engines of Sodor episode I did with Duck and Harold, where Harold crashes in the fog... Obviously, they wouldn't do it that intense, but something like that, that really shows the limitations of a helicopter, you know, and the rails, you know, kind of like what they did with uh, Thomas Percy and the post train. You know, again, though, I feel like I'm just kind of nitpicking, but yeah, um, I hope you guys don't shoot me for this, uh, but I'm putting it in B. All right, now we come to one good turn, and I feel like this is the exact opposite of what I just said about All at Sea. Uh, I like this episode fine as a kid, you know, just simply because I love seeing Bill and Ben. But as an adult, this one just, it just seems to get worse every time I see it. Uh, so I'm going to put this in the D tier. Now, again, I should emphasize this is nowhere near the misery of, like, Buffer Bother. But this is basically Twin Trouble, but with the other twins. Now, Twin Trouble is an episode I feel like is just okay. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that when I get to season six. But in Twin Trouble, you can, yeah, it's also a petty argument. But you can understand as to why, or understand more at least, as to why Donald and Douglas got in a big fallout and how they reconciled. I mean... A good comparison, you know, Twin Trouble, they reconcile after Donald gets in a major accident, and, you know, Douglas has to help him, so, yeah, you can kind of understand, you know, that's a more understandable reconciliation, whereas here, again, I always forget which one was pull doing which, one of them is pulling the heavy train, can't do it, the other one's mocking and laughing at him, so yeah, it's a really tense moment, but all of a sudden they're just like, oh, they just start laughing, like, oh, let's be friends again, ha ha ha, all good forever. I mean, what? I mean, you guys were hating each other's guts, you know, the past few days. This just came out of nowhere. I mean, yeah, just... Also, I, the fact that, you know, it, they treat this plan as, like, some big cahoot so, or conspiracy that the Fat Controller put together, that's just very awkward to me. I mean, Edward or Boko could have just done it themselves. I mean, But just, like, the argument they get over, too, is just so dumb, so stupid. I mean, juvenile. Like, well, uh, again bring up twin trouble. I mean, Donald Douglas get, again, at the beginning, another severe accident. I mean, quite a bad one. And yeah, it's also petty, their fallout, but at least you can kind of understand a little more as to why they would fall out. Where, well, here, like, they just uh, come head to head very slowly, um, and just one of them just doesn't want to back up. It, it's, it, here's the issue. Uh, Bill and Ben work well when they're, they work well when they're both in cahoots with each other, being cheeky. Those are, like, what make Bill and Ben so funny. Like, the prank they play on Boko and the diesel. That's, yeah, teamwork. That's what makes it so funny. Um, and yeah, I'm not saying there isn't funny conflict with Bill and Ben. I mean, the diseasel has some real, I mean, not the disease, um, double, double teething troubles has some really funny moments. But again, that was just like a, a small snippet at the beginning. It wasn't like the whole episode was over them bitching about r running into each other. It, yeah, but here, it's not even that. Again, they just come head to head and like one of them, one or the other refuses to back up. Like, oh, just so stupid, so boring and... Yeah, so, the, uh, again, I should still emphasize, this is not a terrible episode. I get nowhere near on the levels of, like, some of the future Bill and Ben stuff, but... And, again, uh, I, you know, again, Bill and Ben's models look fantastic, and I always love Bill and Ben's Season 3 theme. Yeah, and also, as I was saying before, with them being cahoots in cahoots with each other, them playing tricks on the workmen, that is so funny. Like, yeah, why can't we just see more of that? Um, yeah, this isn't an awful episode, uh, and, again, I'd still watch it if it was, like, on t 
TV or something. It's still one that, if it was in, like, a collection, I wouldn't skip this one, whereas others I definitely will. Uh, but, yeah, it, this is just, like, it's just a very clumsy story. It just feels very rushed. Um, yeah, the, the twin conflict stories, it, you can do them good, uh, but, you know, they have the potential more to turn out pretty bad, and this is unfortunately one of them. All right, next we have Tender Engines. Uh, so this one... Let me see. I'm going to put this in B. Uh, the thing about this episode is, um, so, yeah, as I said, Scarf for Percy was a great adaptation. Trouble with Mud was not so great. I feel like that as far as, like, adapting the story, this is definitely in the middle as far as, like, best adaptation, as far as, like, how good it adapted the story. And I say that because uh, the original story, I mean, if you think about it, it's quite dark at the beginning you know uh, gordon's told that basically all his brothers are dead aside from one i mean man that, that's just really sad uh, and of course the tv series i get why they weren't gonna you know go in depth about that uh so it's one of those episodes where yeah the, it, it really does lack the emotional punch of the original story but i understand why um and i feel like they did a not fantastic but a pretty good job of adapting it otherwise given the i guess the constraints they had to follow um I, what i really like is uh, how they use diesel to convey the you know idea that diesels were replacing steam i mean yeah especially for you know young children i feel like they can get that idea a lot better than if just gordon was just lamenting about it like he was in the story um so yeah i mean i thought they did a really good job in that regard um and also um so the flying scotsman um I do think it's kind of weird, like, uh, maybe they just shouldn't have had him at all, or... Well, actually, having said that, um, I feel like they could have done something like put Henry back in his old shape model and use him. Uh, you know, with the city of Truro, just a character who doesn't move, uh, I feel like they could have found a way to put in the Flying Scotsman. Um, but at the same time, though, I do appreciate the effort they did, you know, to make the tenders. So they at least tried. Uh, yeah, I'll give them points for trying. Um, I feel like the second half of this episode is where it really gets good. I mean, man, Duck is just such a savage. The quote Gordon said, what was it? What's this? Educating Gordon Day? What's this? Educating Gordon Day? Uh, that, that quote is just so funny. Um... But yeah, again, Duck's is such a savage. The prank he plays on Henry. Uh, yeah, I feel like it, Duck's very, it's a great, very much fits in with Duck's character of being clever. And it also really fits in with Henry too. You know, you, you see like the arrogance, you know, that got him shut up in the tunnel. Uh, you know, obviously not in the same way as Gordon, but you know, he just, yeah, just grumpy Henry is pretty funny. I always found it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I feel like this episode did the best they could best it could with probably what constraints it had so yeah i always liked this one all right now we have this little story called escape if you didn't know this episode was so great that they actually adapted it into a movie called the great escape although for some reason they decided to use people instead of engines <laughs> yeah I'm just kidding but i mean what do you guys expect of course this is going in the s tier this is uh just a monumental thomas episode um yeah, what, what more can I say that I haven't already said, or like other people have said? Uh, I guess really emphasizing, this is just such a great example of text-to-screen translation. So what I mean when I say that is, you know, in the book, obviously, you've got the text gives you a lot more freedom to really give more specifics. I mean, Oliver can talk about his whole story of escaping. I mean, the TV series, you don't have as much time, obviously, but what they did brilliantly, I thought, was just by looking at Oliver you know his story immediately. You know he's been through some shit. <laughs> I mean, uh, and the fact, you know, they decide to make him rusty, that it's just, again, uh, you know, like, he's in v a very dire situation. And I guess uh, in the original story, um, he was in the scrapyard for, or wherever it was, it, it never really established, did it? Uh, it was a few days, maybe. Um, and they wrote scrap, you know, to fool the people into thinking he was scrap, where... As in the TV series, you know, with him being rusty, he could have been there for a very long time, or, you know, maybe he started out that way when he escaped, so, yeah, I guess that does 
uh, bring some interesting questions. But yeah, I, you know, those don't matter. It's just such great visuals. I mean, uh, again, it, it just Oliver's scrap model, it's really creepy. Uh, and, you know, that's even heightened more by these brilliant sets. And that's so ironic because these sets were just redressed from like, uh, what was it, Tidmouth Yard? Uh, literally, the... <laughs> the set that was in the scene before <laughs> but again it just shows what i love about models just yeah it's just such a dire atmosphere so creepy so dangerous yeah the lighting um, of course i mean the music obviously just i don't even really know what else to say everything about this episode is perfect uh you know, Donald, I mean, sorry, uh, Douglas rescuing Oliver, I mean, immediately, you know, you can see why he would do that, given his past was scrap, uh, just immediately went to help. What really helps establish this, too, is the first scene with Edward and Trevor, and that wasn't in the book, but it really helps to emphasize to the audience Douglas's past with scrap. I mean, he was pretty much almost in the same fate. Yeah, I mean, uh, Douglas just feels like such a hero. It's just such great character build. I mean, it's... Very subtle, but also just, you know, it's just great character writing. And, yeah, it's just an amazing episode. Um, Yeah, I'm just trying to think of anything else I haven't said before. Um, With this whole thing about Douglas and Trevor is, you know, this is kind of what I was trying to simulate with Oliver to the rescue. You know, obviously Douglas had his experience almost being sent for scrap. And, you know, that passed on to Oliver. And so, uh, you know, Oliver to the rescue was, you know, Oliver passing that on to Paxton. Just, that's why I love writing for both these characters. Um, yeah, it's, obviously, it's a great episode. Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's a fan favorite, and it's obvious to see why. It's, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to think of anything else I can say. It's uh, definitely the best of the season, and definitely among the top five of the show. All right, now we have Oliver Owns Up, which is based on resource and sagacity from the Railway series. Yeah, I understand why they changed that title. Um, at the same time, though, I don't think Oliver Owns Up was quite the right choice. Uh, you know, it's not like he really, uh, he, it's not like he lies about anything. Uh, I guess you could argue he owns up about his mess up with the trucks. But, you know, it, could, it should have been something like Oliver messes up. I don't know. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I'm going to have to put this one in the C tier because the issue I've always had with it is the episode itself is fine. It follows the original story pretty well. But the problem is it's basically the fact that Toad Stands By, the third entry in this trilogy, isn't until the next season. So, you know, this one just kind of ends abruptly. And it's a real disservice because not having Toad Stands By, it just takes it out of, like, the narrative context uh, chronologically, which is, again, a disservice because uh, I've said this many times, you know, when I talk about Oliver. Oliver's character arc is just so fascinating because, you know, after he's gone through all this horror with escaping, you know, he gets cocky and then, you know, that comes back to him and it shows not everyone's perfect even after all these brave adventures. But, you know, Toad Stands By is like the great conclusion where he kind of like takes back his throne. It's just, yes, yeah, such an epic moment. Um, and yes, yeah, so with when that's not until the next season, you know, they have to end this on a very abrupt note. What was that at the end? It's like, oh, he was careful never to be careless with cars again, something like that. Uh, it would be like if Edward Gordon and Henry wasn't adapted until the next season. <laughs> you just can't do that. <laughs> and so I put the blame on this episode as opposed to Toad Stands By because Toad Stands, well, first off, as I said before, I fucking love that episode and I'll get to that when I get to the next season, but... Yeah, it's just really noticeable here. This was the one that they just kind of had to tie up very quickly at the end. So, yeah, they should have either done... Um, yeah, I feel like the best way would have either been to do Toad Stands By after this one this season. Or if they couldn't, you know, just have Bulgy come right after Escape. And then do, you know, this and Toad Stands By in the next season. That order wouldn't quite mess with the continuity as much. Uh, yeah, yeah. As I said before, the episode itself is fine. You know, you see Oliver get really cocky. Um, but again, it's just, it's like there's no ending to this, basically. He messes up, and you just feel like that's the end. Uh, okay, uh. So, yeah, I've rambled a lot about this. Um, yeah, 
I was never really a fan of this one. But again, the overall story, I think, is alright. Again, it's just the context and placement chronologically. Alright, now we come to Bulgy. This one, I'm going to... I'm going to put this one in S, because it's just such a classic. And when I... It's just so poetic. Like, it's a great story about, you know, a thing arrives, is very horrid, but gets his comeuppance by his own stupidity. You know, those are the stories I love the most, you know, like Horrid Lori, where, you know, they don't, like, play a trick on Bulgy, he just gets his demise by, like, his own complete arrogance. It's, yeah, um, it's just a classic episode. I mean, uh, I feel like, in fact, they reference Birdie in this episode. This is, uh, like, Thomas and Birdie gone wrong. If Birdie wasn't so friendly with that rivalry and became adversarial to the railway, yeah. I feel like this is kind of what would happen. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not much I can really say about this one. It just the image of, uh, you know, a bus getting stuck under a bridge, It's it just cracks me up because uh, I feel like this is something that happens in real life all the time. I don't know if you've ever seen those uh, YouTube videos. What is it called? There's this famous bridge. I think somewhere in the US it's called something like 11 foot 8 it's always nicknamed that like the amount of trucks that get stuck under it because you know they don't realize how low it is yeah it's just so funny I would have loved to have seen Bulgy actually get stuck under the bridge <laughs> you know see what happened there I mean yeah I, I get why they didn't show that you know it's you know build up but yeah I mean um it's just such a uh, satisfying episode in that way yeah, Bulgy's a real demon, and, you know, he gets what's coming to him. And yet, you just really feel for Duck, you know, trying to rescue his passengers. You know, it's a, it's not necessarily a chase, per se, but more of like a, trying to get back at him, basically. I mean, Bulgy's always been a funny character. And just him being turned into a hen house at the end. That Again, that's kind of like, you know, with Audrey putting Henry in the tunnel at the end. Just poetic justice. <laughs> So yeah, I've always loved this one. All right, now we have heroes. Um, yeah, it's, this one is complicated because I love this episode, but it does have the same issue as a lot of these non-Audrey season three stories, where you know the it's like it's two stories that don't really mesh well to form one. Uh, I mean, the the plot of, like, Bill and Ben with the trucks and Gordon's coaches, it just doesn't really have anything to do with the second half, you know, the quarry rescue. But, uh, see, should this be an A or S? Uh, you know what? F*** it. I'm putting this in S, because unlike some other episodes with that same problem in this season, I mean, it's it's harmless, the issues this one has, and you, you can easily look over it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is just such an epic episode. Uh, you just seeing these two characters, two of my favorite characters, you know, snap into action, save all the workmen's lives. Uh, yeah, I mean, this could have definitely killed someone. It's it's just such a heroic story. You, you again, it's like a feel good episode to the max. You know, kind of like with them. Um, you know, Thomas and the breakdown train. You just you know, Bill and Ben. You know, uh, obviously uh, not the nicest characters. You know, very cheeky and mischievous. But seeing them, just seeing that they're not that they're really brave at heart. That's I really like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, at the end, you just really feel that, you know, hip, hip, hooray. You just feel like you want to chant in with that. It's it's great. Um, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of this, what I remember is just, like, the visuals of this rock fall are just amazing. I mean, uh, yeah, very great model work. I always wondered how they created scenes like this. Do they just, like, take a bucket full of pebbles and just pour it on the set? Uh Again, kind of like with the Flying Kipper, uh, the set shakes in some of these scenes, so... Yeah, it just emphasizes the destruction really well. Um, yeah, uh, not much else I can really say about it. Um, I, gu I guess you could argue, and yeah, I, I guess I do understand this now. Uh, the first half of them messing up with the trucks, it, it shows that, yeah, they're quite clumsy and not perfect, but at the same time, they're, you know, they're very brave, and that's really all that matters. All right, now we come to, unfortunately, an episode that is not good, unlike Heroes. And this is Percy James and the Fruitful Day. Yeah, uh, I've always hated this one. Um, you were probably wondering, uh, you know, when I said there was a episode on that James Goes Buzz Buzz VHS that was pretty bad, you probably thought I was referring to One Good Turn, but no. 
I was referring to this one. <laughs> yeah, this one, uh, you know what? I'm going to put this in the E tier. Bad. The first one that really goes in this rank. It's really difficult for me to put in words why I don't like this episode. But I feel like a lot of you watching know exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly why. Exactly what I mean. The issue with this episode, I feel like it represents... It's an amalgamation of the worst of season three. And when I say that, it's such a... It's a story that's all over the place. Just It feels so clumsily written. Yeah, this wasn't based off of any Audrey stories. Uh, and now, while this one, unlike some other, you know, the like Heroes and other original stories, is, you know, two different stories being meshed together poorly, this one isn't necessarily that. It's more of two events tied together in, like, the most loose way possible. Yeah, um, it's for starters, the title, Percy James and the Fruitful Day. I mean, obviously, you know, fruitful i mean uh, lit if you take it literally percy gets fruit all over him but think about fruitful i always thought that meant productive and so the events of this episode are clearly the exact opposite of that uh, yeah um i think maybe they were thinking of fruitless that's the opposite of fruitful i guess again percy obviously gets fruit on him but james gets in a jam they make a lot of jam jokes because his brakes get jammed it's Okay, I guess you could argue that's related to fruit. Uh, I guess what really summarizes what I don't like about this episode is Thomas's ending line. He says, what was it? Um, I'm, I'm looking it up right now. Oh, it's even worse. There's more than way one way to get jammed. I mean, okay, yeah. Again, Percy got jam on him. Or fruit, okay. And then he says, uh, we also learned that when engines help each other out, uh, things can still go wrong. Okay, I mean, uh, you look at that at face value. Yeah, I guess that's true. But then he says, this doesn't make any sense. He says, because we learned that, that means we're really useful engines after all. What? What? Huh? Like, he's saying they're useful because they learned a lesson? I get this is just so freaking complicated. So confusing. I, yeah, it's just... I get it. this story feels like it was written at the last minute, maybe by taking different subplots of scripts and just pushing them together and saying, oh, uh, that, yeah, that's an episode. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, I don't know, maybe it was for, like, Shining Time Station, um, yeah, this is just such a sloppily written episode, uh, as far as good things about this episode, uh, well, I mean, the crash is great. Or at least, you know, the first part of the crash. I really like how, unlike some other episodes, you know, where in a crash, you know, they go all over the place. You know, things fly everyone. This one is more like, you know, he hits the rocks and he just goes into the truck in front of him. That's, you know, that's kind of brutal in its own way. You know, it's the same as, like, in Tom and Jerry, a character gets hit by, like, a pan instead of falling over. You know, his face just is suddenly now in the shape of a pan. You know, that sort of logic. But then the second part, is just not good at all because first off what's with these weird music sound effects it sounds like a baby whining like these scared the fuck out of me when i was a little kid and then also the fact that um the fact that they needed to show this at all like why is it the fruit doesn't squirt out until like 20 seconds after the crash you would have it would have been better if they just cut straight from the crash to percy being covered in fruit like it, this always confused me so much yeah, uh, yeah. I just feel like this episode is just made out of very poor puns. Uh, jam, jam factory. Uh, it's yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm getting ranting a bit. I I just feel like this is again a very clumsily written episode. It just you know they had to write one at the last minute. It it just shows so much. So this is definitely the worst of the season, and the first one in this whole ranking, honestly, I'm putting in the E tier, the bad tier. <laughs> Fortunately, though, we end the series on a pretty good note with Thomas and Percy's Christmas Adventure, or as us Americans know it, Thomas and Percy's Mountain Adventure. I'll get to that in a minute, but, uh, you know, just looking at the original UK version, uh, yeah, this, uh, I'm gonna put this in the A tier, it's all, it's... I feel like out of the three Christmas finales, you know, season one, two, and three, this is definitely the best. Just because it has the highest stakes. I mean, the whole village is basically buried by snow. Yeah, it's a fun rescue episode. Um, It's just so festive. I mean, uh, 
I really like just, it's kind of like the inverse of uh, Thomas's Christmas Party, whereas that one, they were throwing a party for a human as a surprise. This one, it's more of the humans throwing a party for the engines as a surprise. I always found that a nice touch. Yeah, again, it's just another feel-good Christmas cheer episode. Uh, people helping each other out. Uh, the ending is great. Um, I, again, just these winter visuals. Uh, the snow, even though it's not very long, the snowstorm scene, it's pretty brutal. Um, but then, you know, when you transition to the next day, just the music and the sound effects of... It just captures thick snow so beautifully. You know, you walk out in the next morning after a snowstorm, and it's just so quiet. So on to, you know, the obvious U.S. version of this episode. Uh, it never really bothered me too much. Yeah, I always thought it was pointless, but it, it doesn't really detract that much. Um, so, if you didn't know, uh, just to sum it up, uh, Shining Time Station had an episode about Thanksgiving, and so they wanted a Thomas episode to be th about Thanksgiving too, you know, to put in there. So what they did is, you know, they just made some edits, so this would be, you know, takes place during Thanksgiving. Uh, obviously, uh, there's many episodes that, yeah, aren't specifically about Thanksgiving, but have themes of being thankful. They definitely could have used those. They should have, honestly. Uh, but yeah, uh, long story short, they uh, basically made it so that this episode takes place during Thanksgiving, and... Um, so, it's not completely out of the possibility, uh, because, um, if you ignore this taking place in the British Isles, uh, there are definitely are quite a few places where, uh, especially in the U.S., where, you know, it snows before Thanksgiving. In fact, I was in Chicago this fall, and it snowed really heavily on Halloween, for <laughs> God's sake. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, especially the fact that they say an early snowstorm. If you go in the mindset of, like, Sodor could be anywhere, yeah, that's not too unreasonable. And also the Christmas decorations at the end also isn't that unordinary, uh, because oftentimes, um, Thanksgiving is often seen as, like, the big final start to the holiday season. Heck, many places put up Christmas decorations, you know, first of November, <laughs> but, yeah, so the Christmas decorations at the end, I always just saw it as, like, oh, happy Thanksgiving, now we're jump-starting the holiday season with all these Christmas decorations, you know, that's generally when a lot of people, like, put their lights up and so... So that's how I always saw it. It wasn't too distracting for me. Um, the biggest problem with the different uh, versions, though, is the fact that they had to edit it in some places. You know, uh, obviously they had to edit the scene of Percy talking about Santa Claus out. They would, you know, just cut out this whole little bit. The problem is, though, they only did it with one version, whereas other versions, you'd have the same audio, but with, you know, that scene still in. Then, so, Toby from this point onward, it would be completely out of sync. Just then, Toby arrived so, with Henrietta. yeah, you'd have it he where, like, Toby arrived during the day, the village. and night, then you would hear the narrator say, that night, all the villagers had a plan to... Yeah, I mean, while well, Thomas is talking to Toby, and, like, when the you know, the, it, they say, like, the engines awoke the next morning, delighted to see all the decorations, while Toby's puffing by the shed at night. I mean, the narration was different, but the music and the video was the same, so that really distracted me as a kid, because, you know, you know on, it would just depend on which video you got. So, yeah, oftentimes, um, you would have the Christmas theme at the end, but there would be no narration. Um, it would literally end as, again, Toby puffing into the sheds. So, it'd be funny, you know, you'd hear all this chuffing sounds while Toby's just sitting there. It... Yeah, there's definitely some screw-up of, like, getting the right footage and all that. <laughs> yeah, that edit problem is annoying, but I don't, that doesn't really affect the, the episode as a whole, because, you know, I know the original version's still there, I can easily just watch that instead, so, yeah, I feel like this was a great way to end season three. All right, so when looking at these results, what immediately threw me off guard, like, I didn't even notice this until I finished this, but it's the fact that the S tier has the most episodes. I was not expecting that from season three, um, but I guess at the same time, this is the first season to have one in the, the bad tier. So I feel like that kind of evens it out, I suppose. Um, and also this has three in the poor tier as opposed to the other two seasons, which uh, had, had only two in, the, in this rank. But um, yeah, so this just shows my uh, theory that uh, season three is very much hit and miss. Uh, you know, it had some a lot of very great stories, but it also has... Uh, not as many, but it also has a few that are just, like, not so great. Um, but, yeah, so, as I said before, uh, Season 3 is an interesting experiment of mixing uh, Audrey and non-Audrey stories. Um, 
again, I keep using these words. Uh, they were hit or miss. I mean, you've got Thomas Percy and the Dragon, Henry's Forest, and Heroes in the S tier. But uh, down here, you've got these are all non Audrey stories. Um, yeah, and uh, also you gotta see. I actually put um, in my original rank video file, I put uh, Thomas Percy and the Post Train in B. But then I realized, you know, I feel like that's sacrilege. It's such a great episode, both visually and, you know, the music. So, yeah, I had to move that up. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I feel like season three is a bit, you know, spotty, I guess the right word. But it's still, you know, very entertaining. I mean, it's still a fantastic, you know, addition to the Thomas universe. All right, moving on to season four. And you can probably predict uh, I'm going to be talking a lot more positively about these episodes than uh you know season three but i feel like any fan would tell you that <laughs> yeah i mean just starting off with grand puff and sleeping beauty or you know bulldog as well you know three great episodes uh i'll get to bulldog in a few minutes but yeah i mean what else can i say that i haven't already said about grand puff and sleeping beauty obviously they go in the s tier uh the duke saga is just a great story about well I'll put it this way, a family dynamic. I mean, Duke is just such a respectable father-like figure for the engines. Um, You know, yeah, he's grumpy, he doesn't take any nonsense, but, you know, at the same time, you know, he wouldn't risk, he wouldn't hesitate to put his own life at risk to rescue Stuart or Falcon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he saves Falcon from falling off a cliff. And, you know, with uh, Stuart and Falcon, or Peter, Sam, and Sir Handel, yeah, they're cheeky to him, they tease him, or they think he's, like, just a huge boar. What was it they called him? A Fuss pop fuddy duddy. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, even though you, they don't really show it, you can just feel how sad they are when Duke's sent away in the shed. You know, by God, I mean, uh, what do you guys think? In my opinion, I feel like Grandpuff is the saddest episode of the whole series. Um, yeah, I mean, there's other episodes that are, like, uh, very emotional, but they're just, like, in a bittersweet way, you know, like Henry's Forest. But yeah, Grandpuff is really sad, if you think about it. Just, uh... This engine being left all alone to be buried by dirt. You know, not to mention Smudger, but you know, that's another story. But yeah, just, uh, and I, again, you know, Duke's my second favorite character. And you all know that if you've seen my other videos. He, he's just a character you want to strive to be like. You know, he's he's so optimistic in his own way. You know, like when he's, you know, stuck in the shed for, he doesn't know how long, it could be forever, you know, he still has optimism, he's like, oh well, I'll just go to sleep to help pass the time, I mean, mad respect for that, it's, yeah, I've gone on about this in other videos, but, um, and yeah, as I said before, when the person falls through the roof many decades later, his first thought is, are you a vandal, like, yeah, it's just, it's so beautiful, because it's so funny, like it, has any time passed for him? Like, has he felt any time passing? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, uh, it... again, what else can I say about these two that I haven't already said? Um, just, you know, the visuals of, uh, the shed being buried. I mean, the music, oh god, just so sad. Again, I'm sounding like a broken record, uh, just also the effects, uh, I don't know what they did, they must have like mixed dirt with water, but these are really impressive landslide effects, and just the way it's edited, showing the model work, the shed being buried over time, I mean, yeah, uh, what else can I say, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to be saying that a lot throughout this video, but um, yeah, Grand Puff is by far my favorite, or I guess this and Sleeping Beauty, you know, because they're kind of one story, at they're by far my favorite story of the the whole season. You know, I'll try to keep this more on the episodes themselves, but as I've said before, I just, I couldn't be more impressed on how they brought the narrow gauge engines to TV. I mean, uh, especially when you re you hear about how much of a pain in the ass it was to get these models to work correctly, given how small they were. I mean, <laughs> I've had experience of that myself with my own N-scale models. <laughs> and, you know, just... Such a great way to introduce all these engines. But also speaking narratively, I mean, I really appreciate the choice to start with Grandpuff as opposed to Four Little Engines. Because, you know, the Duke stories are just such a great, how to put this, great setting, uh, with, especially with Thomas telling the story. Uh, so yeah, uh, Grandpuff and Sleeping Beauty. And now we're going on to Bulldog, which also goes in the S tier, and I get it for the same reasons. Uh, it's just a great example of Duke's character. Just 
Yeah, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is this the, I guess not, because, you know, it's not the closest, but one of the closest times an engine has come to death. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, in the Railway series, and, you know, if you look at the Festiniog Railway incident that it was inspired by, too, uh, I think the loco just derailed on a hill, so, yeah, he could have rolled down the hill, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like this, you know, this massive cliff. Yeah, I mean, just the danger, you really feel it. I mean, uh, and like the close-up shots, you know, just, you feel the tension. You know, Duke trying to pull Falcon back onto the tracks. Um, yeah, so again, uh, this is a great episode because, you know, it shows, you know, that great interaction of, you know, Duke being the father figure and Sir Handel being a little shit, but, you know, being rescued at the end. Um, I guess I'll say, uh, this episode was kind of hard to find in the U.S., or I guess not hard to find, but I rarely saw it because the only video that had it was a songs video, and, you know, I didn't really like those, so, yeah, it's, uh, I didn't really see this one much as a child, but, boy, I remember it quite a bit, uh, yeah, just such great model work, I mean, the height of this set, this must, this set must have been huge, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Duke's a real hero in this episode, and, uh, yeah, I feel like this should have made my favorite episode list, too. Alright, now we come to You Can't Win. Now this one, um... Let's see, uh... I'm gonna put this one in, uh... I'm conflicted. A or B? Um, cause... You know, I'm gonna put it in A, because it's just such a great karma story. I, it's not as memorable as the other three of the Duke episodes. Uh, I feel like that's just because, uh, as a kid, it was kind of hard to follow what the prank was Duke played on Peter Sam, so... But yeah, uh, it, it's a great episode nonetheless, and again, just shows, you know, Duke being such a clever engine. Um, I guess one thing I'll talk about here is, uh, you know, obviously they pull into Croven's gate at the end. Um, so... I feel like uh, the show establishes, unlike the railway series, that uh, the Minnesota Railway is just the Scarloe Railway. And, yeah, I can definitely understand why they chose that. Um, I never really had a problem with that. I just always thought it was like the Scarloe Railway closed and then reopened when they got Scarloe and Reneus. But, yeah, I, I just thought I'd add that in. Uh, I didn't really have a problem with that. Although, you know, having, having them in cameos uh, does make it a bit distracting. <laughs> but, yeah, uh... I don't really have much to say about this one. It's a great karma story, and yeah, I believe this is the last time Duke ever speaks, so a moment of silence for that. <laughs> Alright, now we come to Four Little Engines, which is actually supposed to be the first chronologically in the Railway series, but, well, actually, no, it's two stories. Um, what was it? Scarloe Remembers and Old Faithful, both combined into one, called Four Little Engines, which was in the book called, guess what, Four Little Engines. <laughs> what is that in French? Um, Les Locomotives Quatre Petites. I completely butchered that, I know. I'm so sorry to all you French people, <laughs> but... Anyway, um, so this is an episode I completely forgot existed as a child. And I say that for two reasons. One, uh, all the, the first season four VHS went directly from the Duke stories to A Bad Day for Sir Handel. And then second, um, A Bad Day for Sir Handel, uh, that's technically supposed to be introducing Sir Handel. Because, uh, Scarloe remembers an old faithful, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's the first and final story of the book. So, it's like Sir Handel's in Four Little Engines, but technically... Technically, he's supposed to be introduced in a bad day for Sir Handel. So, uh, yeah, you can see why I would get confused. Um, yeah, like a lot of episodes, I remember seeing the video that this was on, but not this exact episode. But anyway, uh, I'm gonna put this in the... I'm gonna put this in A. Uh, it's a very simplified but great intro to Scarloe. It really does him justice. Uh, just the overall, like, uh, something about, like, I don't know what it... It's the music, that's what it is. At the end, you just feel so proud of Scarloe. Like, the way it ends in that little ditty they have. Uh, yeah, it's another one of these wholesome moments. <laughs> you know, you just feel so good for Scarloe. It's basically, he would rather break down than have his passengers ride home on a bus. That's... 
that's really respectable. So yeah, uh, not much I can really say about this one. Um, I guess I should say, uh, going back to the out of order with Sir Handel, you know, the coaches push him off the tracks because they think he's playing tricks again. Um, well, that wasn't addressed until the next episode, A Bad Day for Sir Handel, where he called him cattle cars. So yeah, I, but you know, those are kind of just nitpicks. Uh, I, I can overlook those. They're not too distracting, but yeah, so I feel like this is a great introduction to Scarloe, and I guess Reneus too. And with that, you know, on to a bad day for Sir Handel. So, this one, let's see, I'm also going to put this one in A, um, simply because I do like the original story, he doesn't derail, he kind of just, at least the way I interpret it, he does something where he, like, somehow pushes the rails outward, like, pushes them aside, and so he's just sitting there, you know, between the rails, basically, uh, yeah, you guys know what I mean, um, and I feel like, you know, the crew probably didn't know how to do that with these models, uh, and so instead they just made him, you know, derail normally, yeah, it, it gets the same result, you know, he could have just, like, run very roughly over something, uh, and just, you know, the fact that they were able to derail him without any, like, handwork, you know, off-screen pushing, that's quite impressive. They must have rigged the model somehow. Yeah, I feel like this is a great introduction to Peter Sammons or Handel, uh, just, um, I always laugh at the quote, Scarloe felt really bad for Peter Sam. <laughs> just... Yeah, I, I again, uh, I do think they should have put this one first as far as like uh, before four little engines, just continuity wise. But um, it's not really an issue here. It's just some minor continuity issues. Uh, but yeah, also, uh, I really love this fat controller theme they put here. It's just really he's in deep shit. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Next up, we have Peter, Sam and the refreshment lady. So this one is interesting because as a child, I really did not like this one. Well, first off, uh, I didn't really see it that much as a child because like Bulldog, it was on one of those song videos. But, you know, I also had the book, so you know, I read it a lot. Uh, the reason I didn't like it was because at the end, I always interpreted it as when it said Henry chortled away, I always thought Henry actually chortled away without the passengers. Like, he actually did what he was threatening to do. And, you know, so naturally I was like, that's kind of a dick move. I mean, what happened? Did he get in trouble? Uh, but I guess as an adult, I'm realizing, no, it just, he had chortled away either just casually or just, you know, laughing that Peter Sam fell for his joke. You know, I mean, the passengers made the train, obviously. Guaranteed connection. So yeah, that's why I never liked it as a kid. Uh, as an adult, um, you know, I'm going to put this in the C category because knowing the actual correct story, uh, it's, it's fine. Uh, there's just not much action, you know, not much happens. It, it, it's basically Thomas and the Guard. Yeah, I, I guess my opinion is exactly about Thomas and the Guard. It's, uh, you know, both are about a train, an engine leaving someone behind. Yeah, the, uh, it exists. That's pretty much all I can say. Uh, I, I know this was based off of a real-life incident where, actually, I feel like Audrey was the guard, and they left behind, I think it was his mother-in-law, so I feel like that's quite funny. But, um, yeah, uh, there's just not much to this episode. I don't really have an opinion on it as an adult. Uh, although I really love George Carlin's Italian voice. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean by leaving me behind? That's all I can really say about that one. All right, now we've got trucks, or as the Americans know it, Rusty Helps Peter Sam. God, I hate that U.S. title. And funny enough, uh, they only use that U.S. title in some DVDs or VHSs. Other ones use the original U.K. title, weirdly. Uh, that's like calling an episode The Fat Controller in the U.S. But anyway, um, I'm going to put this one in B. I want to put it in S, but... Simply for the reason that the Rusty scenes, you know, with him and Harold at the beginning and the end, are just really awkward. Um, you know, they, they weren't in the original story. Uh, it, they just feel forced, um, you know, s setting up Rusty more, you know, for his episodes down the line. Uh, no pun intended. Um, but yeah, uh, it, these scenes are just very weird. Uh, they're pointless. I mean, they don't lead on to anything, you know, like he's, Harold says, hello, Rusty's like, I don't have time to talk with you. Goodbye. And at the end, he's like, oh, cheers. Keep up the good work. Uh, very awkward. But yeah, it, it, it's not too much of a letdown. And I say that because the crash in this episode 
is wow. It is brutal. <laughs> and yeah, I'm sorry I keep using that word, but really, it's yeah, <laughs> amazing how they pulled this off. I mean, just everything flying everywhere. I mean, with these small scale models, they give it such weight to it. I mean, yeah, it's bravo. I mean, uh, you just really feel how painful it is. Uh, it's one of those crashes where it's both really brutal, but also over the top too, but in a funny way, you know, like the trucks, you know, fly everywhere and hit, what is this? Kind of like a, I never understood why there was water raining on him. What's... Oh, I guess it's the water tower. I didn't realize that. Uh, well, I guess where was the water coming from? Anyway, uh, yeah, Peter Sam looks pretty beaten up, if not more than the railway series. I mean, and strangely, the U.S. version misses some music cues that were in the U.K. version. Uh, like, first off, you know, when Rusty rolls away, and then also in the crash scene itself. But honestly, I feel like it makes it even more intense, because it just, you just, yeah, I mean, it kind of like with Stepney Gets Lost, no music in the smelter scene. It just makes the scene way more intense. Yeah, and the music afterward, you know, when he's being pulled out of it, uh, the sad music, wow, I mean, it's, yeah, I don't really know what to say, it's just, you really feel Peter Sam's pain. <laughs> so yeah, uh, that's why I wouldn't dare rank this any lower than, like, B. In fact, yeah, I want to put it higher, but still, just those rusty bits are just, actually, you know what, yeah, I'm putting this in A. Yeah, this definitely would go in S if it weren't for those rusty bits. But, yeah, I, this is just such an amazing episode with the crash and all that. And the rusty bits, while awkward, they're not that bad. So, yeah, this is going moving up one. Again, it's just such a great... The crash is just honestly within the top five, honestly, I'd say that. And that's saying something. <laughs> but, yeah, um, it just I just always found it so cool seeing how these slate contraptions work you know the incline and all that so yeah definitely go i'm putting this and moving this to the a tier and next we have uh, home at last let's see i'm gonna also put this in a because i feel like it's such a great introduction to duncan not much happens in this episode but i feel like what makes this episode so great is just the quotes uh duncan himself i mean his lines are just classic uh what was it he said? Like, those should be tunnels, not rabbit holes. Does anyone else feel like I sound more Russian when I <laughs> try to do Scottish accents? But, I mean, then, of course, the Fat Controller's line at the end is, by God, that is one of the most incinerating burns at the end. <laughs> oh, was this line in the original book? Because I know the book came out, like, in the 50s, but <laughs> tunnels are not dance floors, and you are not a pop star. If it happens again, I shall find ways to cut you down to size. Your career is on the line. Oh, man, just so clever. And I always, whenever I see this, I always think of WTL Network's joke where he, What was the name of that song? Something Common People? Where, yeah, but uh, was this line in the original book? I know the book came out, what was it, like 1959? Pop stars, was that really a thing back then? Uh, obviously the eight, uh, 90s, but anyway... Um, yeah, it, it, those two mo uh, that moment alone just makes this such a legendary episode. <laughs> All right, in this next episode, well, uh, you can guess what the title is. rock and roll um you guys didn't know there's actually a deleted scene from this episode where duncan's uh i forget he was dancing to that rock and roll song while walking down the stairs and uh for some reason he was wearing clown makeup <laughs> i'm sorry I, I hope i don't get flagged for that first you know just copyright humming that song and also just given what the artist did you know later in his life ugh. yeah rock and roll uh, yeah, so, uh, I, I, I'm gonna put this one in the A category, too. Uh, it's, honestly, this could be, like, a two-parter with, uh, Home at Last. It's, it's just Duncan at his best, you know. I, 
I love you know, when you compare Duncan and Sir Handel. Uh, Sir Handel, you know, they're both, you know, grumpy engines. Uh, Sir Handel's just more arrogant, like, he just, you know, very full of himself. Where Duncan is just, um, well, I, I, his quote says it all, you know, plain speaking. He just doesn't have a filter. He just, yeah, uh, rough guy. Um, I forget if this quote was in the episode, but it was something like, uh, one of the engines says he used to work in a factory, so that explains his language. <laughs> Oh, I'm just imagining Duncan bustling around this factory in Scotland, yelling all these obscenities. You know, kind of like uh, uh, Peter Capaldi, uh, whatever role he did before Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, what else can I say about this episode? Uh, I do like how they build up the relationship between him and Rusty, even though... You know, it is kind of just tossed out the window in future seasons. But, yeah, so, I mean, uh, you know, Duncan says some really horrible stuff about Rusty. Uh, and I like how, uh, you know, James tells him about Diesel, where, uh, yes, they've had, obviously, they've had good Diesels before in the show, but it, it, it really shows a contrast between, uh, you know, good Diesels and bad Diesels. It just, you know, Diesel is just a form of propulsion. Uh, yeah, like the ending scene of him ma uh, making it up with Rusty, uh, that's just a really nice nice moment um yeah it's a uh, again i keep using this word just a very wholesome moment uh i guess my only real nitpick is that uh you can s clearly see uh to make his rock and roll they just bent the tracks a lot uh yeah it, i feel like they could have at least put like some something in his motor or something to make him shake but that doesn't really bother me too much um but yeah it just uh george carlin's duncan voice um it's just so great uh what was it about George Carlin and, like, British voices, you know, Scottish, English, uh, so, uh, yeah, there's rock and roll, and also, uh, I, I should have said this in the previous episode, uh, I've said this before, I really appreciate them choosing to paint Duncan yellow as opposed to just red, you know, you probably just confuse him for Reneas, although, unlike, you know, Peter Sam and Sir Handel, who already had pre-existing colors from Grandpuff, I always wondered why they chose yellow for Duncan, like, what does yellow have to do with him? Yeah, obviously rusty, orange, uh, but yeah, there's rock and roll. And now we come to special funnel, um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna put this one in S. I'm sure you've all seen Unlucky Tug's video where he says this is his favorite episode, and yeah, I can 100% see why. It's just visually a stunning episode, just so beautiful. It's crazy because the plot itself is pretty simple. It's not like some grand adventure. It's just Peter Sam losing his funnel and needing to use a drain pipe. But wow, these visuals, its they really went full force. Um, just like the water, the torrents, uh, the bridge breaking. And yeah, it's just so much atmosphere. Honestly, it's almost like the two halves of these episodes are two different episodes. You've got the first episode, or half, where, you know, it's the storm, and, you know, they have to replace the bridge, and then later on, when it gets to the snow, uh, you know, Peter Sam losing his funnel. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, I believe this is the only season four episode with snow. Uh, that's quite impressive, actually. I didn't really think about that. But, yeah, uh, Special Funnel is a fantastic episode, just for, like, the atmosphere alone. Um, you know, kind of like with Percy's ghostly trick. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I can say. Uh, just the music, too. Uh, I love Rusty's theme, the, the arrangement they have here. Yeah, going back on atmosphere, I know I'm talking about that a lot, but honestly, these, um, these shots just remind me of being, like, in the California Redwoods when it's really foggy. Yeah, it's just so beautiful. Yeah, and it's kind of just, uh, a great ending for Peter Sam, you know, uh, as far as him finally getting his, uh, being more powerful than the other engines, um, yeah, kind of like with Henry, uh, yeah, uh, an amazing episode. All right, now we have Steamroller, and I'm also gonna put this in S. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a great episode. Just, uh, well, first off, I mean, the story is just so funny. I mean, I love Sir Handel, and I especially love George. I mean, yeah, but uh, also just, like, on a technical level, this must have been really hard to pull off. I mean, just, you know, the scene where Sir Handel gets hit by George, it's, you know, the camera's moving, and then you've also got to have Sir Handel moving, and then George moving, all at the same speed. 
and then you know also get the crash right this must have been really difficult to pull off very impressive how they did it uh and i guess um one reason i love sir handle is that you know talking about i was talking about the difference between duncan and sir handle earlier i feel like duncan would have just you know said f off to george or you know swore at him whereas what was the lie sir handle was like you no know, no george was like you swank around pretending you're as good as me and sir handle's like Actually, I'm better. Goodbye. Ooh. <laughs> Need some aloe for that burn. <laughs> He's basically uh, the Scarlowy Railway's James. <laughs> yeah, I love Sir Handel. But, you know, George, too. I mean, um, you know, most of it's, you know, it's from season five. But just the voice George Carlin gave him. It's like Louis Armstrong if he was in the mafia, Italian mafia or something. It's wow. It, it I can't do it. You know, it really hurts my throat. It's like, <laughs> oh yeah. So that's why I had to change the voice in the um, remastered version of that George episode from Engines of Sodor. But yeah. Um, also, you know, I really like this arrangement of all, all the music in the, you know, the famous scene. Uh, it's like uh, so many themes mixed together to create such a tense, comedic scene, basically. Yeah, uh, not much more I can really say about this. Uh, I, I also love how it, <laughs> the sound effects of all the people arguing. It's like all these sped up chipmunk voices. <laughs> just <laughs> Yeah, and the policeman there. Um, I wish they would have put in that. Oi, you! from uh, Thomas in Trouble, but this is definitely Sir Handel's greatest episode. All right, now we've got Passengers in Polish, or uh, what is it, Passengers in Polish? I'm so sorry, I'm sure someone's already made that joke, but yeah, I feel like a lot of people don't like this episode, and I can definitely see why. It's not a lot of action, it's just basically Duncan throwing a temper tantrum. Uh, thing is, though, for me at least, I always found Grumpy Duncan so funny, and I'll get to why in a second. Uh, yeah, this episode's fine. Uh, C or B? Um, I'm gonna put this in B, but, like, it would be a very, very low B. Like, lowest you could get, 80%, B-. minus. Um, because I've always had a soft spot for this episode, because, I, again, I just, Duncan's just so funny. Uh, it's really hard to explain why. Uh, I think George Carlin's voice has a lot to do with it. Michelangelo's does great, too. Um, I just love how Duncan's, uh, like I said before, whereas Sir Handel would be very arrogant and full of himself, Duncan's just unfiltered, put it that way. He's just so unapologetically lazy. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like, you know, he's uh, one of those, like, nasty, uh, he would use, like, workers' rights as an excuse to be lazy. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in fact, there is a quote, what was it, like, I'm overworked and I can't stand for it. Passengers get polished, but, oh, I'm sorry, no, it was, Peter Sam gets a new funnel, but I'm not, e passengers get ice creams, but I'm not even polished. <laughs> He's just so quotable. Uh, George Carlin's accent, just so great. It just makes it so funny. Um, yeah. Um, I will say that the viaduct set in this episode is so impressive. Like, I wonder how big this set was. Like, uh, I find it so funny how he just conveniently stops right by these, uh, what are these, like, triangle extensions? Or, you know, so the <laughs> crew can, you know, stand more comfortably. But... Yeah, I can definitely see why the passengers would get so angry. I mean, being stuck up here, it'd be really scary. I mean, like, the worst place you could stop. <laughs> yeah, there's really not much else I can say about this episode. Um, oh, I guess I do like at the end where, you know, the Fat Controller leaves, you know, Duncan basically mutters, uh, to put it bluntly, like he says, oh, just shove it up your ass. What was it? No polish means no passengers. I <laughs> mean, yeah, again, this just goes to, like, Duncan being so unfiltered. Um... Yeah, I feel like this episode's just mainly a setup for Gallant Old Engine, but even though it's not the greatest, it's it's still fun, for me at least. Uh, I have a soft spot for it. Alright, and speaking of Gallant Old Engine, that is the next episode. And I feel like uh, my opinion of this episode is the same as a lot of people. This is going in the S tier. It's fantastic. Um, one thing I really like is... In the original Railway Series story, I believe it was just windy. Uh, it, it was still sunny. Whereas here, they made it stormy. And that magnifies the tension like ten times. I mean, again, just these, like the special funnel, these beautiful 
but, you know, eerie storm shots. Uh, when they say Renee is stopped on the loneliest part of the island, yeah, you really feel that. <laughs> yeah, it just feels so isolated. Like, um, yeah, this is... I feel like this is a combination of Percy's promise and Edward's exploit. Um, in fact, they use the storm theme again. It's just such a rewarding story. I mean, at the end, you just feel so happy for Renee. It's just, you know, everyone's reaction. It's... Oh my god, the ending of this episode. Uh, I've probably said this before in another video. That music cue they use... It's like a rearrangement of that so-called triumphant theme. Uh, by God, just the ending of this episode is almost tear-jerking. I, I, I don't know why, just the way he says, like, oh, it makes an engine feel like he's really come home. It's just, wow, you just gain so much respect for Reneus. And, yeah, it just kind of puts him, like, in this mythical state. Status, you know, he wasn't around a lot for this season because he was away, and he finally comes back. You know, it's like the return of the king. You know, <laughs> yeah, return of the warrior. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of anything else I can say. Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying this so many times, like the model work uh, with like all these small models, knowing how difficult they were to get working properly. They just unbelievable how greatly they pulled this off. I guess you know. Uh, He's not my favorite character, but Renéus, I think, is the best-looking character. And I say that... Something about his design, you know, Dolgok. Uh, he was the engine I rode when I rode on the Tally Flynn Railway. I just always had, like, a nice connection with it. Um, yeah, maybe because his model's, like, very streamlined. But his tanks aren't as big as, say, like, Sir Handel or Scarloe. But yeah, um fantastic episode you know this was another vhs i had although for some reason this was like the second to last episode as opposed to the first but yeah um gallant old engine all right now we come to the henry's forest of this season and i say that because apparently audrey wasn't a fan of this episode either and unlike henry's forest i can definitely see why um I love this episode, don't get me wrong, I think it's fantastic, but I'm gonna put this one in A. It definitely deserves that high rank, but I feel like other people would put it in S. I just can't put it that high up, and, uh, well, I'll explain why. Um, I always thought this episode was good, like, I never had a negative opinion of it. Um, my opinion on it is definitely growing better than when I made those other videos, but so Stepney is a very complicated character. You know, he's a real life locomotive, um, and his stories in the railway series are supposed to emphasize on uh, steam preservation, you know, the Bluebell Railway. So I definitely understand why they would want to change up his story a bit. Especially as the sh they always have this, uh, they try to like minimize real world references. Um, so yeah, and I feel like Stepney having like an escape style rescue is a great idea. And you know, it would fit well with Oliver as the main character, you know, with him with his past experience. I guess the issue is, um, I know it's, you may, it may not seem like a big deal, but it just comes down to the fact that Rusty's narrow gauge. The fact that why does this narrow gauge railway go all the way to... To the mainland it just raises it just really confuses me like it just raises so many questions um it seems like it takes him a whole day to get there so it's not just some yard outside of Crovin's gate uh why is there a narrow gauge railway here in the first place i mean would tourists really want to go all the way up here what use would a narrow gauge engine have here unless it was like his own railway you know just a little loop around yeah, and then, uh, I, I, get, I sound like a broken record, but it just raises too many questions. I'm sure I put my thoughts in words. It's just a very, uh, well, uh, just sum it up. Having, there are two ways you could fix this story. One, you know, I already suggested, use Oliver as the main character, have everything be standard gauge. Or if you wanted to use narrow gauge, fine, uh, maybe have Rusty discover Stepney in some abandoned, um, shunting yard, like somewhere on the Scarlowy Railway. What really, I feel like it really does show that this episode was written just to put Rusty in the spotlight. And I like Rusty fine, don't get me wrong. He has some great episodes. Um, but this episode just, he feels really forced in that way. And also, like the, the Bluebell Railway, uh, I think they're implying that it's on Sodor. Uh, okay, yeah, I can buy that, uh, just... It's a heritage small railway, the narrow gauge railway goes by. Uh, but then that asks the question, um, 
I'm sorry, I, I sound really confused, because I am. Like, uh, obviously, I think this railway does take place on Sodor, because, uh, you know, in other seasons, like, Edward goes to help out with Stepney, so it's not like it's the real Bluebell Railway. But then uh, that also kind of undermines Stepney's role, because unlike Stepney being, like, a foreign visitor, you know, coming a long way to see the engines, why can't the engines just go visit him on his Bluebell Railway? Especially since we see Thomas go by. It's not like the railways and a completely separate part of the island that narrow gauge can only access. And then the, there's some other questions too, like uh, how did everyone know Rusty was rescuing him? Like, they arrive home, there's a huge party for them. Oh, okay, I mean, uh, I guess it wasn't so secret. How did he smuggle him out of the scrapyard? I mean, you know, because escape, they kind of had to like, but yeah, smuggle him into the works. And it isn't until the end you realize the fat controller already knows, but was okay with it. Again, just trying to think of my thoughts here. Um, I found it so... I get this is just... This doesn't really matter. But I found it so funny, like, he's... Rusty's in the shed at the, at night. And then the next day, they're saying, Oh, it took him a long way to... took him a long time to get the other railway. And he's going on the viaduct. But in the very next shot, he's literally going right by the sheds again. Isn't that where this is? <laughs> so, yeah. You... I feel like I've talked about my main issue enough. Um... It just kind of undermine. I'll put it this way. Having this very confusing idea of a narrow-gauge engine going all the way to the mainland, especially since, you know, unlike Hero the Rails, you can't have... There's less urgency. Like, the engines can't, you know, buff, buffer up to Stepney and move him out. Uh, it's just convenient the driver was there. What if he wasn't? Uh, yeah, and what's Rusty's top speed? What, what, like 30 miles an hour? I'm sure Stepney's is a lot faster than that. Um, so yeah, I feel like just the amount of confusing questions that this concept raises kind of does undermine the whole story, uh, the whole rescue. And again, that's why Oliver would be a great character to do for this. So as far as like railway realism goes, the reason why Rusty and the Boulder or Thomas and the Jet Engine work for me as far as ignoring realism is because, well, basically the fact that they give the audience an excuse or like reason to completely bend the laws of physics, you know, uh, they just fully embrace how batshit the concepts are, you know, and they do it for like the sake of entertainment where, you know, like, um, Thomas and the Jet Engine does it for a really funny episode and Rusty and the Boulder for a very action-packed, eerie, supernatural one. Yeah, those episodes just couldn't exist without those uh, wacky concepts. Rusty to the Rescue, on the other hand, um, these uh, unrealistic aspects don't work as well because it doesn't really give, or at least give me, enough reason to, you know, suspend, you know, disbelief and all that. Uh, because, you know, the whole narrow gauge stuff, uh, the concept works completely without it. So, as again, you know, using Oliver or something as the main character. And so what happens is it just becomes distracting. You know, Thomas and the jet engine, obviously, you take out the whole jet engine going hundreds of miles an hour down the track. I mean, then the episode doesn't exist. You know, it's built around that concept. You know, it's like that, you know, uh, up, up in a way. I always use this example. Uh, they, it's like this wacky, ridiculous idea of blowing up balloons and just attaching them to the trucks. But it's not needed because the plot didn't need it because it's just a boring friendship drama. That's why I always use that example. I feel like that's the main thing. It, it never really acknowledges that being an issue, whereas it's something you just can't really ignore, at least for me. Um, but anyway, that's just fully my opinion. Um... That said, though, I've talked about negative things quite a lot. Um, I still do think this is an absolutely incredible episode. It's, yeah, I would still put it probably in, like, the top, not top 20, but definitely, like, top 30, 25? Uh, I mean, it's just, like, uh, the model work, the music, just, it's just such an epic story. So... I feel like I have to watch this just by, like, not turning my brain off, but just turning off my critical skills off. Uh, it's definitely still a really enjoyable episode. Uh, yeah, these scrapyard sets are really spooky. And like with Escape, you know, they just redecorated Croven's Gate, I think. Um, the UK version, the way Michelangelo is, is echoed when he's like, Who are you? Well, yeah, that's really spooky. You know, George is just kind of like, Who are you? But, um, 
I feel like a lot of people have already said, you know, what's so great about this episode. Uh, just the build-up to when Stepney leaves with Rusty. You know, the music, uh, the way it just builds up, and then when they finally get that shot over the viaduct by the moon. Yeah, it's just another, such an epic moment. So, yeah, I feel like this is an episode where the flaws for me just still completely baffle me, but yeah, I still love, it's like a love-hate I don't even want to say hate because I don't hate this episode. It's just more of like the good stuff in this episode mostly outweighs the not so good stuff. Um, yeah, uh, as I said before, it just needed like some rewrites. Uh, yeah, uh, Rusty to the rescue. Um, it's clear they wanted to have like a, they wanted to give Rusty more screen time, and you know they they made this episode to be like the front runner of a VHS, you know. Although like with Gallon Old Engine, it wasn't the first story; it was kind of like towards the end. Although I guess you know it is quite an epic story. You want to save your epicness for later, but uh, yeah, I've talked about this one long enough. Um, it's definitely an A for me. Uh, again, I don't dislike this episode at all. I just feel like it does have some serious issues that I just can't overlook. Um, one more thing I should mention. Um, the VHS, Rusty to the Rescue. Uh, other Americans, do you guys notice that the episodes on this video are... The audio quality is just so much more crisp and clear than, you know, the other U.S. narrations of Season 4. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, you compare them, it, there's quite a difference. Am I the only one who notices that? Uh, you know, even as a kid, I noticed a difference. Um, I guess my only theory is that they recorded them at different times. Um, I do know Rusty to the Rescue was one of the only Season 4 episodes to be in Shining Time Station, as opposed to, you know, those Mr. Conductor's tales. But, yeah... I, that was just a random observation I always had. I've always wanted to ask that question. Anyway. Alright, now we have Thomas and Stepney. And this is a weird one because, you know, with the big departure Rusty to the Rescue threw in, uh, it's based off of two stories. A small segment of uh, Blue Bells of England, where Stepney arrives, and then also uh, the second half of Stepney's special. So yeah, uh, Stepney's special, uh, it's the first half of that story in the book is Stepney just talking about the Blue Bell Railway and all the other engines. Uh, yeah, that's where they would show all the paintings of the other engines. So yeah, obviously they had to do a drastic rewrite but i feel like this episode is a pretty good way of um getting the stepney story back on track with the books and i don't mean back on track is a bad way i just mean like you know getting it back into the overall narrative so i'm gonna put this in the b tier i think it does it pretty cleverly uh yeah so i mean uh, it simplifies the story down to just like thomas being jealous of stepney like he was in the books i thought they did that pretty well I always remember the, the night scenes of this episode for some reason. I don't really know why. Uh, first off, season four did a really good job with night scenes and industrial atmospheres. Again, I don't really know why. I think it's just the lighting, uh, but also just like the music, the way it Stepney's theme mixed with that, uh, you know, what did they call it? Busy Engines theme. I always loved that, where he just rushes by Thomas. Yeah, so, uh, although, oh, I should add though, this shot right here always scared me, this guy. Yeah, this episode's fine. Uh, I don't really have much to say about it, but yeah, it's a nice little simplification of the story. I guess my only issue is, uh, and again, this was maybe in the book too, but uh, I never really understood how Thomas went from being jealous of Stepney to suddenly just being like, oh yeah, I guess we both have issues with our branch lines. Um, yeah, I, I get what he's saying. I just thought it didn't convey it very well. Uh, just maybe a few more lines of dialogue. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the ending, though, it's pretty nice, these two becoming friends. So, yeah. And next we have Train Stops Play. And, you know, this is more a clear adaptation of the Railway Series story. Uh, yeah, so, th like with Four Little Engines, this is one I don't really remember seeing that much as a child, you know, because it was also on that VHS. Uh, Thomas Meets the Queen was never put on DVD for some reason, but, um... Fun fact, my dad had the Stepney book as a child, so this has been like in the 60s or 70s, so he remembers this story pretty well. Alright, uh, yeah, I mean, um, let's see, uh, I'm gonna put this one in A. Uh, yeah, because I feel like it's a pretty good chase story, uh, 
it just yeah, it's just so funny how determined these cricket players are to get their ball back, like driving after a train. I mean, you thought they would have brought another ball. It's yeah, it's just a funny story. Uh, I really love uh, Caroline's voice, the one George Carlin gives her, like uh, just there. Uh, Oh, that train went in the tunnel. I can go home now. Like some redneck wife. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I wish we saw Caroline more often. It, I feel like this is kind of the opposite of uh, Percy and Harold, where that episode, Harold probably didn't know Percy was racing him, whereas here, Stepney doesn't know that Caroline's racing him. <laughs> yeah, uh, and also this episode, you just see a lot of... Stephanie's model is just so beautiful, just the color, uh, especially the close-up shots with the cab, like, they really managed to capture the detail of him, and as I've said many times before, uh, I always thought his name was Stephanie a few times as a child, <laughs> but, yeah, um, this is another enjoyable episode, it's going in A. Okay, with this next episode, I've never been able to figure out the correct pronunciation, is it bowled out or bowled out um i assume it's bowled out you know because it's a bowler hat he sucks in but <laughs> bowled out could work too i mean he gets into a whole farting storm when he fails <laughs> yeah uh but whatever uh whatever the correct pronunciation of this episode is uh you know i was originally gonna put this in a but i'm actually gonna put it in s because this is just such a great another great bad character comes and makes a fool out of himself it's just such a funny episode you know, for one thing i'm really glad they decided to do this one because they always seem to be very reluctant to do stories with uh you know one-time characters i mean yeah you know, flying scotsman and city of truro were obviously trimmed down quite a bit and you know, they never did super rescue but yeah uh they decided to do this one with this one-time diesel uh what is the correct name for this diesel is it i just call him class 40 you know that's what his name board says i feel like the diesel is just too vague but yeah uh again it's just such a funny episode um what I love is just the fact that this brand new modern locomotive goes into catastrophic failure just because he sucks a hat into his air intake. I mean, that's just so pathetic. And, but then also just the reactions, like the inspector, like, Oi, you've pinched me out! <laughs> and then even better, the fat controller, he basically just says, to put it bluntly, F*** your hat, you've caused a delay! <laughs> Oh my god, um, yeah, and just this, the Class 40's facial expressions are pure gold, like, look at this, it's just so uh, pathetic, uh, again, that's how I can describe this face, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, also, it's really great seeing, uh, Stepney and Duck rescue this train, uh, and the fact, you know, they, you know, they take over, and they get the train early, uh, that's quite impressive, um, you know what? I've just realized something. I'm sure it was intentional that... Well, better explain. Uh, Stepney, the Bluebell engine, like I said before, the book highlights steam preservation. That's the whole theme. And, you know, that kind of comes through, too, with Rusty to the rescue, him being rescued from scrap. I think it was probably intentional that a story, the last story in this book about steam preservation is a story about steam triumphing over diesel, old technology proving over new. That is very clever. Uh, does anyone else think that? I'm now thinking that may have been intentional, just poetic. Yeah, is there anything else I can add? Uh, I, I, yeah, I always love the lines. Uh, I think this is the second time you hear the Disgraceful. Disgusting. Despicable. Yeah, this is a great end to the Stepney stories, and yeah, so this is going in the S tier. Such a funny and epic episode. Alright, then we have Henry and the Elephant. Um, this one I'm going to put in S also. Uh, this this was like, what was it, 19th rank in my top 20 video? And yeah, it's still in that rank. Yeah, I still love this one. Um, you may already know, this was the... F 
with the exception of Thomas and Gordon, which they just moved a few stories forward to the beginning, you know, because they want to have Thomas as the main character of the first episode, uh, this was the first story that was not adapted in the order of the Railway series. Uh, in fact, they skipped it from season one to season four. Yeah, it was supposed to be before Tenders and Turntables, uh, the the elephant incident was one of the incidents that made all the three engines go on strike. So naturally, they had to make a few changes, uh, you know, particularly at the beginning, or remove all the references to, like, Henry being repainted and, uh, you know, old shape, basically. But they did a f fairly good job. I say fairly because the Thomas scene at the beginning just feels really... It's just nothing, basically. It's padding it has nothing to do with the rest of the story uh, but that's a very very short scene so i don't really that doesn't bother me too much um <clears throat> but other than that i feel like this is definitely a story you can do outside of the narrative context as opposed to say trouble with mud uh yeah and honestly i feel like waiting until season four was a big benefit because i don't know i just feel like it wouldn't quite have the same effect if it was done with all the season one cinematography or, you know, particularly the music. Uh, yeah, the scene where Henry goes in the tunnel, the music, the way it's shot, it's just, oh, it's so intense. Uh, I love how they basically build up the reveal of the elephant. Um, yeah, I feel like it just wouldn't have been the same in season one, but yeah, I, I'm sure it still would have worked. But yeah, here it's... Yeah, it was quite a creepy scene, but it's also really funny too, especially, uh, it must have been rubber ducks they used for the sound effects of all the workmen running out. <laughs> That's just so clever, and uh, they just did a really great job of, you know, with the humans and animal characters always being static objects, they still did a great job with this scene, uh, you know, like with the, the trunk moving in this dark shot here, uh, yeah. I always found it so funny how it, it's clear they must have, like, taped the elephant on the front of the train or, like, used some sort of tack thing. <laughs> yeah, again, there's not much I can really say other than this is just such a classic. I've always loved this one. Alright, now we finally come to Toad Stands By, a whole season later than it should have been. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, y you all heard my thoughts on Oliver Owns Up. They should not have waited a whole season. Uh, it just... Yeah, I, I put the blame on Oliver Owns Up, though, because uh, that episode just suddenly abruptly ends. Um, Toad Stands By, on the other hand, yeah, even though it's a whole season later, it's... I mean, you know, I've already said this many times, it is just such a badass redemption episode. Like, this is definitely going in the S. In fact, yeah, it was in my top 20 episodes. It just shows what I love about Oliver. Just such... I feel like this is the most satisfying episode. Do you guys think that? Uh, yeah, because, you know, uh, Oliver, with just all the trauma he went through with uh, escaping from Scrap, then he's humiliated horribly with the trucks and the turntable, and then in this episode, he just puts his fist down and is like, nope, not anymore, and then basically reclaims his throne by ripping the ringleader apart of the trucks. <laughs> it's just, oh my god, it's just so comically brutal. I love it. It, yeah, what else can I say that I haven't already said? It's just, ooh, such a great takedown. It, it just, the fact that he used Scruffy's plan against him, uh, oh my god, the build-up, you know, with the music, uh, you know, they reused his escape theme. It's, yeah, I mean, just the build-up, it's just such a perfect episode, I just don't really know what to say, it's, uh, yeah, I always wondered what the basis for this episode was, there's got to be a real-life basis, uh, I couldn't find it when I did research for that video I did a while back, but, yeah, it, it's kind of like the opposite of Brake Van, in that episode, uh, the Brake Van, I guess, was being pushed by the trucks into Douglas, so he imploded, whereas here, like, uh, the trucks are pulling back, Scruffy's pulling the other, I mean, uh, Oliver's pulling the other direction, so he gets ripped apart, yeah, the sound effects, too, where he just collapses so comically. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, the Railway series, it's a lot more brutal. He just basically falls to pieces. Uh, I, yeah, I can understand why they didn't do that there. And, yeah, I having him repaired, I mean, yeah, I can understand why they did that, not wanting to have a death in the show, but still, it. I don't know, I thought Scruffy's fate was more than well-deserved, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, what else can I really say about this episode? Uh, oh, I guess just George Carlin's scruffy voice is perfect. It's kind of like this... It's weird. It's kind of like uh, 
this mobster 1920s gangster, which is weird because uh, Oliver's season three voice Carlin gave him was kind of the same. Uh, I guess he took Western, but a different type of Western, you know, <laughs> Western U.S. as opposed to Great Western. Um, uh, whereas here, he just uses normal voice. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I always loved how he sang the truck song. Uh, Michelangelo's too, I mean... Uh, I love how there's such a difference. Carling just does it, like, very nastily and... Yeah, oh, if it's no use at all. Whereas Mike Lance was just shouts it. I just found that so funny. Uh, yeah, um... I guess I never really got into Carlin's toad voice. I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Uh, Alec Baldwin's was the perfect one. Just... Oh, hello, Mr. Oliver. I don't know, that just didn't... Really, but, yeah, that's... A nitpick. Uh, yeah, um, I love stories like these, you know, where a character yeah, basically makes a fool out of another one, just gives such great karma and payback. Uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, don't mess with old Ollie. All right, next we have Bullseyes. Uh, I'm gonna put this one in A. This is another great engine meets animal and all havoc breaks loose. Uh, yeah, this is one that kind of like... Uh, well, I guess I should say, first off, unlike Oliver Owns Up slash Toad Stands By, this is an episode where it works fine outside of the Railway Series narrative context. Uh, this was between, uh, what was it, Daisy and Percy's Predicament, but this episode works fine on its own. But uh, kind of like The Flying Kipper, this is an episode I didn't see much as a child. It was also on that Thomas Meets the Queen VHS. Uh, so yeah, um... Yeah, I mean, this is always a funny episode. Uh, again, it's one of those engine meets animal and things go wrong. Uh, I feel like what I really like about this episode is uh, the music is the best part. Uh, it's kind of like this good, the bad, and the ugly spaghetti western, or, or I guess more like Spanish bullfighting music. Uh, yeah, it, it just really sets the tone of uh, <laughs> the bull. Um, yeah, and it's also, it's this episode is a lot like Mavis. Uh, Mavis and Daisy both made a complete fool out of themselves, and Toby had to come to the rescue, you know, very sly, and just, yeah, Toby's just like, I told you so. <laughs> yeah, fun fact, I think Daisy's theme in this season, even though it has some real sounding instruments in the background, it's the only one in season four that still has those synth instruments, um... You know, season three, it was kind of a mix, whereas here, Daisy's was the only one. And this is only the, I think it's only the third appearance of Daisy at all in the TV series. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess Shining Time Station was over at this point, so it wasn't that big of a deal at this point. Uh, I also really like how they, uh, the narrator said the bull's thoughts, like, Now for my breakfast! <laughs> I found that funny. Um, yeah, uh, I'm just trying to think of anything else, uh... This is a great episode. Yeah, I think this is, in my opinion at least, this is Daisy's best. Um, I mean, that's not really saying much given she only had, what, three, yeah, three appearances. And, well, I guess Calling All Engines too in the classic series. Uh, Daisy was a vastly underused character, even if you ignore her being absent from, sh because of, sh you know, they thought she was too sexist for Shining Time Station, but, yeah. All right, next up we have Thomas and the Special Letter, which is based off of, I believe it's called the Fat Controller's Engines. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the Railway Series story title? But anyway, I'm going to put this one in the S tier because I feel like the decision to change it where in the Railway Series they were just kind of like becoming a museum piece. They were just being displayed to the public so that people could just go see them. Uh, you know, like us, uh, people didn't believe in them. I feel like that raises a lot of questions because uh, aren't all engines in Railway Series universe alive? I mean, Stepney, Flying Scotsman. Uh, so yeah, uh, the decision to change it from that to, uh, you know, going to visit all the children children and you know the children get to interact with them and say hello you know it, it always like it's kind of like uh the engines all going to a convention <laughs> you know all the fans can say hi I mean, it, it, do you guys see what i mean but yeah it's something about that change you know all these kids getting to interact with the engines it's it just makes it so much more, well, wholesome. I mean, I keep using that word, but yeah, just uh, it just makes you want to be a kid again. Like, the ending of this episode, you know, the music. Oh, oh man, it's in the same vein as uh, Edward Trevor and the Really Useful Party. Um, yeah, it, I guess it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, celebrities going to visit sick children in the hospital. Uh, yeah, it's just this sort of 
kindness that we need in the world right now. It, so I thought that was a brilliant choice. And let's see. Oh, I mean, Thomas's crash in this episode is upgraded like by 10 times <laughs> from the original story. In the book, I think he just like hit some buffers too hard. Whereas here, not only does he go through the buffers, he goes down a hill and then through a brick fence, <laughs> like a brick wall. <laughs> My God. Wow, just upgrading it so much. Um, uh, th this is another VHS I had as a child, uh, Thomas and the Special Letter, and that had a lot of great season four episodes. Um, yeah, so uh, I just always like seeing shots of all the engines together. Uh, for, I mean, the ending, obviously, but at the beginning, too, you see, like, almost every single uh, standard gauge engine on Sodor. Yeah, I guess I didn't realize that. Um, uh, but, yeah. Uh, this is a great episode, just um, a great adaptation from text to screen with a lot of changes. Um, yeah. Alright, now we come to the final episode to be adapted from a Wilbert Audrey story, Paint Pots and Queens, or as I've always known it, Thomas Meets the Queen. So originally, I was going to put this episode in the S tier, but I had to bring it down a rank because when I really thought about it, um, well... I guess you all know the issues, uh, the fact that this episode does screw a lot with continuity. Uh, so, in the Railway series, this story was after Down the Mine. It was the final one in the Gordon the Big Engine book. So, yeah, it was like his final redemption. So, for whatever reason, they didn't do it in season one, but they did it here, a whole three seasons later. And kind of like other episodes with that same issue, it, it kind of undermines Gordon's character arc. Um, they decided, though, at least, you know, keep, like, the references in. But then the bigger issue was that they decided to make this episode take place right after Down the Mine. I mean, Gordon and Thomas are literally coming home from the mine at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> That could work if you had it where either you kept to the season one style or had it where Gordon was like telling it as a flashback. But no, they have characters like Duck, Donald, and Douglas in this episode who didn't appear for a whole season. So yeah, it just really messes with the continuity a lot. Uh, it's just really distracting. Um, maybe it wasn't intentional. They just forgot that these characters hadn't appeared yet. But uh, yeah, again, it's just really distracting. Acting. That said, though, this this episode is still fantastic. I mean, uh, for one thing, I really like that they actually show the queen. Uh, I think in the book you just see her arm coming out of the train. Uh, but it just feels so patriotic at the end. Just the music, the build-up, it's... Oh my god, that arrangement of God Saves the Queen is just... Oh! <laughs> it makes me so proud to be half British. It's, yeah, it's like the same as uh, Thomas in the special letter, where just this great wholesome ending, like, it's almost tear-jerking. Uh, seeing all the engines together, being so proud of them, just, yeah, it's, this should have been the final finale to season four. It's just such a great ending. Um, yeah, uh, so as far as anything else I can say, um... Yeah, I mean, uh, Henry getting the paint dropped on him, I always thought was really funny. Uh, I always liked how they added a sound effect of the workman groaning, and I don't think that was the narrator. It must have been someone else. You kind of hear him in the background going, Ugh, as he falls over. I guess I do wish they actually showed the paint drop on him, but yeah, yeah that's a minor thing. Uh, I'm also pleased that, you know, given that in you know the previous episode, uh, they're trying to keep Sodor away from being a real-life place, uh, the fact that they decided to, use, for this episode, kind of stick to the real world, you know, with the Queen and, like, all the coda arms, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, but, man, this, this ending was just... Oh, th again, this should have been the ending to season four. I don't know why they chose Mind That Bike, but, you know, I'll get to that one in a minute. <laughs> All right, next we have Fish. I want fish. Engines don't go fishing. And, uh, and, uh. I'm sorry, too much Keeper of Beans references, but, uh, yeah, this is an episode that I don't hear many people talk about. Um, I'm actually gonna put this one in the A, too, because I feel like this is a really underrated one, at least in my view. Uh, just for the fact that the night atmosphere 
is so great in this episode. The first half, you know, the night atmosphere is so beautiful and relaxing, whereas the second half, it's pretty creepy. Like, yeah, the second half of this episode, just the scene of Gordon's Hill, it, yeah, it's really eerie. Um, I just, I think the fact that it's just very flat lighting, you can't see much. Yeah, I mean, um, I love Henry's season four theme. Um, this episode establishes that the Flying Kipper is definitely cursed. <laughs> But, I mean, just look at these shots. I mean, uh, these beautiful night shots. Uh, just Season 4, I think I said this in the Rusty to the Rescue, it did a great job with relaxing, calm night shots. I mean, yeah, these shots are just gorgeous. And, like, the harbor being at work, just all the busy, bustling industry. I feel like this is a great episode just about steam engines. Uh, the sound effect when Henry leaves, uh, you just feel the weight of this massive iron horse. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's not much else I can really say about this episode. Well, actually, I can say it's the first appearance of that goddamn scary Henry spooked face. Yeah, that face always creeped me out. Uh, you know, haunted Henry. Um, yeah, it's, uh, this is, I feel like this is a really underrated one. Just the night visuals. The crash is great, too. Uh, yeah. All right, next we have Special Attraction. And this is a very weird one uh this one's pretty controversial and yeah i kind of agree uh i like this one a little better than i feel like a lot of fans do but i still am gonna put this one in c i would put this one lower if it weren't for the fact that the bolstrode crash is just so great i mean <laughs> yeah so i feel uh, i believe this is based off of two stories um the second story is just called Bolstrode, but I honestly forget what the first one was called. It's it's from a Toby. Uh, they're both from a Toby book, but uh, yeah, it was a Christopher Audrey story where Toby does he goes like the mainlanders on holiday. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, yeah, this is like um, where season three had a lot of these like double stories merged into one that didn't flow well. Uh, this is, I think, the only one of this season. Um, it's not awful, but it is it the worst of the season? Probably, technically, but again, I still like it because of the Bolstrode scenes. Um, yeah, uh, but just like Toby going to this like fair and being a special attraction has absolutely nothing to do with the second half. I mean, uh, the quote at the end is just so, what is it, like, oh, we're all special attractions, we just smile and whistle at people. I mean, what does that have to do with Percy drowning a barge? <laughs> I mean, God, it's... I always wanted to see Bolstrode again. It, Bolstrode is like, it's weird, he only appeared once, or at least in this show. I know he's appearing in, like, All Engines Go, but he only appears once, yet there was merchandise of him everywhere. And I can understand why. He's the first and one of the only named boat characters in this era, at least. Yeah, they could have given him a, like, redemption story, like, uh, Bulgy Rides Again. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, as I said before, uh, Crash and Bolstrode is great. Um, hey, this episode's not awful, but it, it is quite confusing. So, this is going in the, in the C tier. I'm kind of mixed on it. Um, yeah. And now, finally, the final episode based on an Audrey story. Uh, until, what was it, season 20? Um, but yeah, and that is Mind That Bike, based on a story by Christopher Audrey. I'm gonna put this one in B. Yeah, it's a nice little episode. Um, I always love George Carlin's Irish accent for Tom Tipper. Yeah, this is just one of those, like, relaxing, uh, yeah, not much happens, but it's just a very soothing episode, I guess. Um, I mean, the beginning of this episode, just showing, uh, the van going around the island, wow, it's just so beautiful, these shots. Uh, yeah, the music, um... I swear this is supposed to be a representation of Michael Angelis right here. Uh, yeah, and um, it's just the irony that Tom Tipper gets a new van because Percy destroyed his company's cost-cutting measure. <laughs> I always found that funny. Yeah, I did help by accident. Yeah, that's quite funny. Um, I guess my only issue is just the placement of this episode in the season. Why was this the final episode? Uh, again... Thomas Meets the Queen should have been the final. That or uh, Thomas and the Special Letter. It's Yeah, this episode's fine, but it's just 
Yeah, and there's other seasons that have ending episodes that are just average, but the thing about season four is, again, it had episodes that were, like, hand-picked for you to have in the final. Obviously, they chose not to do a Christmas one this year, which is fine, uh, but yeah, Mind That Bike should not have been the final one, uh... Although I will say the ending ditty, not intentionally, but something about the ending ditty, it does, it kind of does feel like a very short, brief, but nice little end to like, you know, end of an era, end of the Audrey episodes, and end of George Carlin's reign. Like, yeah, so, uh, this is another episode I don't remember seeing much as a child, uh, because, again, it was on that Thomas Meets the Queen VHS that, uh, that VHS was never reprinted, and I never saw it that much. Um, Thomas Meets the Queen itself, and some others, those were on other VHSs, like, I think, Best of Thomas, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think this episode's fine. It, again, it's a nice, soothing episode. It just shouldn't have been the last one. Oh, God. I was not expecting this video to be this long. My God, this was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I, this is going to be over two hours long. I I guess I just had so much to talk about. I, I hope the next video I make in this series isn't going to be, well, I guess it will be, or longer, because it's, I have to do three seasons, season five through seven, you know, I want to keep that all together, but yeah, even with, um, splitting this video in two, you know, season one through two and three and four of the Audrey era, yeah, I, I, this went way longer than I expected, I sincerely apologize if that was, uh, annoying you guys, but, um, yeah, so uh, as far as season four goes, as you can see, it's definitely, on average, the episodes are much higher than season three. Um, I guess, you know, season three, uh, well, you can see, um, season four, there's no episodes below that C rank, where season three, um, yeah, they had quite a few in the S, but they also had a few in the poor, and I think it was one in the bad ranks. So, yeah, the season four is more like, on average, better. I guess I'll put it that way. Season 3 was hit or miss. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, uh, I think a lot of that just has to do with the fact that see, Season 3 uh, that had a lot of those uh, non-Audrey stories, which, uh, uh, again, were hit or miss. That's all I can really say about that. Um, you know, this chart right here for Season 4, it just also shows my, uh, my opinion that, honestly, there is no Season 4 episode that I dislike. You know, because the lowest ones, Peter, Sam, and the Refreshment Lady, and Special Attraction... Sp Peter, Sam, and the Refreshment Lady is just... Eh, it exists. And, again, I like it better as an adult than I did as a child, because, you know, I know the actual story. But, um... Uh, special Attraction... Yeah, it's clumsy, uh, it's weird, but... You know, it's still... The Crash and Bullstrode is just so great. Yeah, so, I mean, season four, um, yeah, I can definitely see why people often rank this as the best, uh, like a general fan consensus. Um, don't quote me on that. That's just what I've observed. Um, it just seems like a lot of people say this is the best. Uh, and again, you know, my favorite season, you already know, it's not season four, but it, season four is definitely number two, you know, as I did in that, said in that video. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that they... Again, I've already talked about this so much in Seasons Ranked video, but the fact that the way they brought the narrow gauge engines to screen, just such a hole in one. Yeah, especially when you read about, like, how difficult these small scale models were. And just, you know, uh, only doing, like, half of the original stories would have sufficed fine. But they decided to do all of them, or at least most of them. Yeah, I mean, 16 episodes focused on these guys and the rest for standard gauge. That was a huge gamble, but yeah, it paid off so well. Um, anyway, there's season 3 and 4. Um, again, uh, season 5 through 7 will be next. And I feel like, as I said before, I want to keep that video together. I don't want to split that up, so that may be longer. But yeah, this video right here was a lot of work to make. Now... Uh, I'm going to try and focus on some other stuff before I get started on the next one. Uh, you know, like Horus and all that. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not going to say expect that soon, but just be on the lookout for that. So yeah, thanks for watching and see you next time.